Rahmatullah. Welcome to the Safina Society podcast. How you guys doing? Alhamdulillah. 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 So, uh, first question to you, yep. Dr. Shadi. What's your favorite surah? Uh, Alam Nasrah. And why? Uh, the reason is that it was the first surah that had actual relevance, not relevance, but uh, use, or I should say that I actually recited it and would recite it often when I was in trouble. Right. And, uh-huh. you know, young people get in trouble in different little silly ways. Some people are worse than others. But let's say if it was for school or if it was some jam I did, something that I did bad or something that was wrong, having memorized this small surah was like the surah is telling you if you're in this type of hardship. Right. Mm. And then it tells you, you know, it gives you something positive. It tells you that uh, things are going to get better for you. Right. And with hardship, there's ease. Verily, with har- that hardship, there's ease. So I would recite that surah every time that I was in trouble with either school or behavior or something like that. So, I don't want to put you guys on the spot, but let's. Nas? Uh, I think uh, probably Surah Baqarah. Oh, mashallah. Yeah, very. I mean, if you. Um, that surah, if you read it, it really suffices you. Like surah Baqarah for yeah. me as well. Surah Baqarah like, encompasses all of Islam. And I love uh, what I love about Surah Al Baqarah is actually very easy. It's uh, sort of an introduction about human beings, mm-hmm. humanity at large, the believers, non-believers, and hypocrites, right? And then uh, it's all stories of Bani Israel, yeah. stories of Prophet Adam, but also Bani Israel, right? And then it's all ahkam, all laws, 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 with a little bit of an intermission, I guess you could say. At the end of the second juz, it's more stories of Bani Israel, and then it, it closes with the uh, famous khawatim mm. uh, of Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, yes? Sorry to put everybody I mean, on No, it's, th- it's not putting me on the spot. I mean, there's so much that you could say here, right? Um, I would say Al-Ma'un is my Mashallah. favorite. Mm. Um, you know, for all the obvious reasons. <laughs> the tremendous, the, the, way that it, the way that it speaks directly to my own shortcomings every time. The fact that it's a perfect reflection of the shortcomings of the, the modern Ummah. Mm. Um, the world that we see around us, it, it's it's a good check on your own uh, nifaq, mm. um, especially when you're rushing through that asr prayer, right? Mm. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, asr the Sahaba words described that they loved asr more than they loved their families. Wow. wow! Yeah, so there was actually an incident in which they wanted to kill a Muslim, so they said, or there were some Muslims uh, encamped, and another tribe wanted to kill them. So they said, wait until they have a prayer called Asr that they love more than they love their families. So wait for them until they pray Asr and then you can kill them all. Wow. Yeah. Well, they didn't know, though, that the Salat al Khawf was revealed. <laughs> <laughs> Psych <laughs> twist. Right? So they, uh, alhamdulillah, the deen is really practical. Yeah. And Salat al Khawf is when you're fearing for your lives. They, you pray with one, Im- but you still want to pray with one Imam, right? right. So, so there's this physical thing is not just about efficiency. Because why don't you half the group pray, half watch, the other half pray, the other half watch, right? So this, there's still something about having one imam. So Allah wants us to have one imam. So one imam prays, two rakahs, let's say it's four rakah prayer, and half the group watches and half the, watches guard and half the group prays. And then the imam, he stays seated for the tashahud, right, the whole time. And all his job is to just stay seated and wait for the iqamah, right? So the first group will pray. Raka three and four, and salam out. The next group will call the adhan, all get together, and call the iqama. Once they call the iqama, he gets up, and then he starts reading his third and fourth raka, which is their first and second. Wow! So that's called salat al khawf. I right. knew of salat al khawf, but I didn't know it was, it was done that way. Yeah, I mean the funny thing is for the Quran is salat al khawf is described, but the actual salat al non khawf is not described, <laughs> right? Regular salat is not wow. described. How to do it? But salat al khawf is described. Wow. So this is Muslims are in danger for their lives, yeah, and they're still adhering to praying behind one imam. Behind one imam, yep. So when I see people arriving late at the masjid <laughs> and making their own uh, little jamaah, little jama, yeah, in the s- in the middle of the of the masala, yeah. Come on, man. So yeah. wait, what what are you supposed? I mean, it, let's say you do get there genuinely late, so then what do you do? Just pray by yourself? You should accept the punishment of your tardiness, which is that you don't get the reward of praying in Jamaat in the Masjid. Yeah, and because you actually <laughs> didn't make it. In according to Malik, it's Stop the Salah it. behind the Imam Ratib, because right. the, what's called the Imam Ratib, which is the permanent Imam, is actually a Sharia position. Right. Mm. Right. 
and reward the reward of jama'ah prayer is to pray behind the imam of the mosque so if we arrive five minutes late and the salah is finished right and make our own jama'ah it's not jama'ah wow. right it's not jama'ah what if, what if there's mush- yeah, yeah what if there's no established like jama'ah yeah mushroom. then that's different then, that's, then you're living in, in an anarchic state need to get any man yeah well, that's our but mission. but that actually <laughs> that actually might even come into question about the conditions of a masjid right mm. it'll still be a masjid but i mean one of the things about a masjid is that the five prayers are established mm. right? they can't so, be established on the basis of do we get four uncles that show up but yeah, yeah. so i i could tell you exa- examples like that i mean not not mufti niaz's masjid but there's a couple here right there's like the turkish masjid i mean there it's Nobody's there most of the time. So the yeah. Jummah and then like anybody who kind of wants to pray, it's like there. So it's not really a uh, it, the five salahs are not established. It's I not mean, open with an imam for every five per. Correct. Yeah. So it's not a masjid. Yeah. Oh. It's not a shari masjid. Yeah. Hmm. But I mean, in in this, yeah. they they do or have it's a like masjid. they do have like prayer times online. It's like okay, we have thought also. Like so, if somebody's there, they would lead it. But it also, so it's like a population issue, right? Also, that community is possibly collectively sinful mm. like it's an obligation right that mm. you have to have somebody it's 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 for, it's for kafaya to establish but if prayer. nobody yeah. does it it's it's haram on everyone yeah. oh. wow so now, uh, now speaking of the khawatim of surah al-baqarah there's a beauty this is a beautiful hadith and in nu'man ibn't uh and in nu'man uh ibn bashir qala qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inna allah ta'ala kataba kitaban Allah Ta'ala has written a document before he created the heavens and the earth by 2,000 years. And it's with the throne. The arsh. And from this document, two parts of it, two lines from it have been uh, revealed. And they are the two last two surahs, uh, ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah. If they are they are never recited in a house three nights in a row, except the shaitan can never enter it. So if you recite it for three days in a row, it creates a type of barrier for shayateen to come into it, right? But if you don't, then you know that barrier won't be there. Another one says, "An Abi Huraira radiyallahu anhu qala." Don't make your homes graves. Right? And Shaitan flees from the house uh, from which Surat al Baqarah is recited. And th- that was by Muslim. And the previous one about the document that created before 2,000 years, before the heaven and the earth, is from Imam Al Tirmidhi. MashaAllah. Mm, What's it, what's Imam uh, what's uh, Sheikh Al Albani <laughs> modern gra- grading of that? <laughs> so, <laughs> it doesn't matter. So I, I I think the the main topic that we wanted to bring up for today's episode is the importance of the Quran. Yeah. Right. And not so just a, a general idea of the importance of the Quran, but to discuss you know why, especially the the remembrance and the recitation and the tilawah of the Quran has fallen in in. I would say it's fallen a lot in the Western world, right, yeah. amongst Muslims. Uh, I know, especially if you look at, you know, even the, the past generation, uh, whether it's immigrants or non-immigrants, you know, I, I feel like that the tendency to read and do tadawa of the Qur'an, even in the, the as late as the, the 90s, right, it was there, even especially amongst Salafi communities. It was there uh, when the... Uh, the Diyobandis and Tablighis were around as well. As, you know, it, was, it was big, right, the tadawa yeah. of the Qur'an. It's. I find it very interesting that over the years, people have you know started to learn more, take more classes, uh, read books, and all of these things, and yet the the tilawa of the Quran and the remembrance and the the dhikr of the Quran has fallen. Um, and I'm I'm just curious as to why that's happened, and, and to talk about the importance of this. Let me jump in with a quick a quick uh, story about this. Uh, I know of a of an older uh, convert became a Muslim later in life. And, you know, busy with family and life and work. So never really had time to study Arabic. But he loved the Quran so much. Listened to it all the time, recitation of it. And memorized long surahs in translation. Mm. Memorized them. Knew the translation of it in, by memory. Mm. Like that was his love. That the, m- the amount of love that he had for the, for the Quran. Both the meanings and translation and the, the recitation of it. Mm. SubhanAllah. I, and I, I think that, <laughs> that type of... 
Uh, that type of story can be related of a lot of people. I know even my mother, my grandmother, uh, grandfather. I mean, uh, so many people I can think of doing like khatam and khatam and khatams of Quran. And like, I'm just like, oh, like, you know, khatam of Quran. That's really hard even in Ramadan, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, re- I relate that only to, to forestall anybody who goes, ah, but Arabic. So difficult. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fine. Yeah, absolutely. But there's translations. Good ones now. Well, I, I have an idea about that is that in the in our material society, everyone's looking for something that the, we our notion of value is different. Right. So learning something is a value. Right. Whereas just reciting something is viewed as not a value. Right. Think about that. Mm-hmm. Like, OK, I just recited it. What's the value in that? What can I do with that afterwards? But what we have to realize is that uh, in our deen, we do have a substance that is called nur that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tells us about it it's a substance it's a subtle substance which is granted to people when they do ibadah and it's granted to people its function is discernment it allows for discernment it allows for you to see the truth as truth and, and follow it and avoid and see the falsehood as falsehood and you know hopefully avoid it so without the concept and belief in the, uh, of the pivotal role of light in the individual and the community and the world at large, then you'll find that worship goes down and decreases, right? Whereas the opposite is the case. Once we, when we, when we think in this type of materialistic way, where everything has a value that's outwardly visible right away, right? Uh, at that point, you're not going to want to do worship. You're going to want knowledge, right? But that community is very similar to the community. We're warned that that is a similarity of the Jews where they have a lot of knowledge, but their hearts are not softened by worship. Like the Qur'an tells us this. The, the Prophet ﷺ explained Surah Al-Fatiha as Al-Maghdubi Alayhim is the Yahud, right? Which uh, was one of my problems with the study of Qur'an because they say that in one narration, uh, it's a tribu- popular narration, it's attributed that the Messenger, peace be upon him, said that Al-Maghdubi Alayhim, those who are, uh, who, whose God is angry with, are the Jews, and the, those who are astray are the Christians. And they said that, and that wasn't of the highest gra- author- authoritative grade, right? What they meant is it's not mutawatir. But, right, what but they it's still sahih. But they didn't tell you that it's sahih, right? So it's what play, playing around with words in a, in a certain way that, okay, are you trying to soften it for your mom and dad who may be Christian and Jew? I mean, no. well, then don't cite it at all, no, right? That's not, that's not, the, that's yeah. not why. They're, we know they're doing we it know. because they think that Jews and Christians are okay if they're Jews and Christians are still... It's yeah, we know we know how they're doing. Now, if I would say, look, okay, let's say you don't want to cite an anti uh, a, a hadith like that, don't cite it at all. But to yeah. mis- misrepresent it like that, yeah. right? And of course, we know that they're, what their doctrine is of, of the perennials. But in any event, the uh, the idea of being full of knowledge, but you have no softness of heart. Okay, that even happens, and I'm not talking about Salafis. That even happens among Muslim groups, mm-hmm. where you'll have. Uh, you have people who have really high academic standards. Mm-hmm. They, 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 their credentials are unassailable. But where's the rahmah? No, inspiration. where's the, where's, where's the, where's the, even the open-mindedness to the rest of normative Islam? Mm-hmm. Right? It's my way or the highway, and the yeah. rest of you people, yeah, you, it might be acceptable, and Allah might forgive you for being like a normal mm-hmm. Ashari Shafi or something, but you're not in part of my group. You're out. Yeah, and yeah. and also you got to think that. Uh, Islam wants, uh, you know, the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam wants to produce. He produced people, and he wants us to be like those who are e- per people that you would want to be with, not just want to learn from. So there's a big difference between a scholar that I really love to learn from him versus a human being that I want to sit with. Right. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, oh, look at the character traits that he implements or imparted upon the Sahaba. One of them was al mu'min alifun uluf, right, or alifun aluf, which means He's easy to get to know, and he gets he gets to know people easily, and he's easy to get to know. He's mm-hmm. approachable, right? And so, uh, a balanced religion is one in which you have knowledge at the same time you're a human being that you want to sit with, mm-hmm. right? And there are some, you know, scholars who worshipful people you just love to be around, right? Right? They're like the misk shops. The whole person is a misk shop. You just want to sit with them, and ibadah does that for people. Now he said that the nasara. Uh, the Christians are, pe- are people of much worship, but no guided law, right? So that's the critique there. And it's not, so this is for those, let's say we have a Christian friend of ours who's listening. Like, I don't have a problem with 
Christians, right? I'm just saying this is what our religion says in terms of how we approach the religion. It's not, it doesn't mean that we're not going to talk and, and even be friends. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with anyone, right? right? And I was thinking the other day, I actually have never, ever said anything about gays and homosexuals themselves. I've only said about people who claim that this is acceptable in Islam, right? right? That's my issue. I've never had an issue with the individual himself. I mean, I had a colleague at Trinity College, a German department, right? He was gay, like openly. German? German. I'm so surprised. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I never had a... Uh, that's that's what he does, right? right. I do have a problem, though, if someone's going to tell me this is part of Islam. Now we're going on the rights of something else. Islam has Absolutely. its own rights, yeah. right? Absolutely. So it's like, I don't have a problem if, you're, if your dog comes and, and does what he wants on my lawn, but he shouldn't do it on, you know, my mom's lawn, because that's someone else's rights. So Islam has rights, and if you're a student of Islam... Your job, if you're you know teaching, your job is to clarify what Islam is and isn't. So this is actually just for the record because you won't find ever I made a statement about those individuals. It's only about the progressives altering our deen inside of it. That's the issue. And just in case there's some guy that goes through looking for one. You know. <laughs> <laughs> to, be f- to be fair. I mean, maybe it's an exception or something here or there. To, to be fair, <laughs> there, is a, there is a strong argument to be made that individual especially broadly accepted individual homosexuality is harmful to society yeah detrimental to the society as a whole not just on a spiritual level on on a very basic material level it's uh it's harmful health wise mm-hmm. it's harmful to children it's harmful to children because of the predatory nature of certain certain types of homosexual communities like all of the male ones um it's it's harmful for relationships between women you know the highest levels of intimate partner violence what you would tr- used to call domestic violence, but it's it includes people that don't live in a domestic situation is between women, yeah, like lesbians. There's but nothing. There's nothing more. And and I say this in all seriousness. You you have two women in an intimate relationship. That is a lot of jealousy, a lot of control, and it becomes really really difficult for them to get along for a long period of time. It's very it's 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 way worse than any other relationship in terms of mm. the fighting and then eventually the violence. But even in that commentary, that's not an attack on individuals. I, that's I, a sh- you're sharing an idea, right? A critique of an idea, mm. right? That's not an attack on an individual. Like, or even you didn't even make an attack on a big group. Anyway, I mean, this is not our topic. Though. It's usually they're victims yeah. Yeah. of something. You, you know what's really crazy um, and why I love Surah Baqara is most of what you guys have been talking about these are the themes of the first four uh, first four uh, ajza, right? mm. well, Surah Baqarah and uh, Ali Imran. Ali Imran. Uh, the, uh, the explanation of Ghair al-Maghdubi alayhim and wal al is Surah Baqarah and Ali Imran. Yeah. So uh, Baqarah talks about the, the faults, the outward faults, right? Mm-hmm. Where the, the Jews, they would have all this knowledge. It's talking about an archetype, right? It's not talking about necessarily a religion. Ju- Judaism is a demonstration of that archetype. Uh, the Jews during the process of time. Uh, maybe even now, who knows? But it's talking about an archetype of all this knowledge, yeah. but no devoted action, yeah. right? No honesty, no sort of sincerity, none of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a, a heart that's dead inside. So you have the famous verse in Surah Baqarah: um, uh, "Their hearts became hard, mm-hmm. right? Even harder than stones." And you know, there are some stones that uh, water flow out of, right? So there's that famous, famous verse, yeah. sort of summarizing what Baqarah is trying to do for you, mm-hmm. right? And then you have Surah Al-Imran, which interestingly talks about the Christians. Yeah. Yeah. So it's talking about, and then it also, in Surah Al-Imran, it's also praising some of the Christians, right? Where uh, there's that verse uh, which has, you know, you'll see uh, many of them uh, that are devoted. Yeah. Right? But what is their fault? They don't have proper uh, laws. They don't have boundaries in their worship. And they have doubt about their doctrine. They they have doubt about their doctrine. So it's this, Islam is this balancing act between uh, confusion on the one uh, on the one hand, and a lot of order yeah. on the other hand, between justice and mercy. And what's really cool is those two ending verses of Surah Baqarah. It's summarizing the the creed of Islam, mm. right? As if to say, look at look at all these bad examples. Here's what's right. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And Subhanallah, this is to me when you talk to the uh, talk about the Quran like this with people with people that you're trying to teach the Quran to, they get excited about the Quran. But oftentimes what happens is we force people to recite Quran and they don't know what they're reciting. They don't understand what it is. They don't 
uh, some of the kids that I'm, uh, I teach at Sunday school, they're just like, why am I doing this? Right? Uh, so, Alex, Alex. I one. was just going to say that uh, to Dr. Shetty's point that we're not, cr- that if we have a, a Christian friend or a Jewish friend that's listening, mm. this is just good advice for you. Mm. Like, we're <laughs> telling you where the shortcomings might be in the way that your uh, co religionists have implemented the the revelation that came to you. Of course, the better advice is say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And I'm not saying that facetiously. Mm. Like the better advice is become a Muslim. I did. Yeah. And so it's doable. You can join you'll be cooler than you are now, trust me. <laughs> um but in the meantime, also make your make your community better. If you're a Christian you see where you're going wrong. If you have any kind of conservatism in your bones, you see where your where your co religious have gone wrong. They've gotten too soft and too easy and it's anything goes. You know, you have rock concerts on Sundays now, yeah. basically, instead of worship. And they have. And uh, the Jews is the opposite. That's yeah. and, they, and there are a lot of voices, a lot of people inside of Christianity calling for a return to Absolutely. what works. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. 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 I, I think what you mentioned, you know, right in the beginning is the modern. The, I, I think a lot of the, the reason why people do not recite the Quran and, and study the Quran as much is because of modernity, right? Like you mentioned. Because it's not as productive, right? Uh, and and I think a, another trap that the student of knowledge or you know just just anybody in, in today's world falls into of shaitan is you know why they were I, I know it happens to me many times and I have to remind myself it's like oh you know you're you're reciting the Quran it's like oh shouldn't you be studying fiqh yeah. or aqidah yeah. or or you know studying some some knowledge that's going to be more beneficial to you because you know knowledge in the scales of you know the is knowledge is you know much greater than just you know uh, worship right yeah, yeah. and so that that there, there's that trick of shaitan and so I, I wanted to just actually read um, I'll summarize it but I'll, I wanted to go through uh, a little paragraph in uh, Imam Nawawi's etiquette with the Quran read it um, so he mentions uh, the Sahaba who used to recite the Quran and how much they used to recite the Quran so Ibn Abi Dawood related from the righteous forebears uh, God Most High be well pleased with them that some of the, some of them would finish the Quran once every two months or every month, once every ten nights or every eight, most of them every seven nights, some every six nights, every five or every four, many every three nights, some every two nights, every day and night, twice every day and night, twice each day and eight times each day, four by night and four by day. So he gave a list, list of some of these people. So every day, so some of these, in, some of those who included the recitation of the Quran every day cl- include uh, Uthman bin Affan, Tamim al Dari, Sayyid ibn Jubair, Mujahid al Shafi, uh, radiAllahu anhum, three times per day. Those who completed the Quran three times per day include Sulaim bin Itr, uh, the judge of Egypt when Muawiyah, radiAllahu anhu, was the Khalifa. Abu Bakr ibn Abi Dawood related that he would complete the Qur'an three times each night, and Abu Bakr al-Kindi relates in his book about the judges of Egypt that he would complete the Qur'an four times in a night, mm. eight times in 24 hours. The righteous Shaykh Abu Abdul Rahman al-Sulami, uh, may God be pleased with him, said, I heard Shaykh Abu Uthman al-Maghribi say, Ibn al-Katib would complete the Qur'an four times by day and four times by night. So, uh, you know, these are, you know, Sahaba, of uh, of the deen, uh, so the Sahaba of the Prophet and these are also like like you know just mentioned the, the the Qadi of Egypt, yeah. right? This isn't just a a random worshiper, yeah. right? Who's reciting the Quran? Obviously, this Qadi had much more to study yeah. than you know you you know the, us regular lay folk who go to a weekend class and think we need to yeah. study much and you know leave the recitation of the Quran. Before we get to <laughs> Alex's point, uh, this just to clarify, this is. Abu Bakr ibn Abi Dawood, so which is not to be confused with the Hadith scholar Abu Dawood of Baghdad of way later. Yeah. Abu Bakr ibn Abi Dawood was very early on in Mecca, and actually one of the karamat of the uh, uh, that he had was that a woman was sleeping one time and she went woke up in the middle of the night in Mecca, and she decided that she would pray a couple of rakahs, and she prayed a couple of rakahs, and then she slept uh, again after that. And then she saw a vision that night that uh, a, a great wedding procession was occurring in the Haram, I should even in Mecca around the Kaaba, and that maidens from paradise were coming uh, to attend this great wedding. So she woke up thinking maybe someone's going to get married today, right? And right in her morning, as she was waking up, she heard a great tumult and people yelling and and sort of crying, and she said. She went to the window, so she asked, what happened? 
and a lady told her, you didn't hear? Abu Bakr ibn Abu Dawood just passed away. That was him. And so, that's him. Yeah, that's him. That's who we just narrated yeah. from. And Abu Bakr ibn Abi Dawood, that wedding was his heavenly wedding because now he's getting his reward. Right? It was all like a horse. He's getting his reward. And death is interpreted right, or viewed, not interpreted, viewed or considered from the perspective of the dyer, the righteous person who dies, uh, as uh, his reward, the day of his reward. Yeah. Right? So that's actually how we view death. It changes the way we live. If we view death as a day of your climax, and unfortunately in the West, we try to climax in this life. But the problem is if you climax in this life and you don't die the next day, there's nowhere else to go but down. That's true. Right? Peak too soon. <laughs> you peak too soon. Uh, there's nowhere else to go but down, right? And, uh, you know, when you go down, it's always a negative. So our view is... You know, you, you you work in this life, you worship in this life, you do good deeds in this life, and you earn your reward the day. That's why there's a hadith: Oh Allah, make the greatest of my days the last of the the day I meet you. In other words, the day I die. Sure. Yeah. So what I was going to say is, uh, just by the numbers, for people that think that those numbers might be daunting, and they are obviously for modern people, we can't do what the what many of the salaf did: eight khatams in one day, right? But if you recite at the speed of al husri which is very slow. You could do 35 khawatim in the time that it takes you to watch all of the seasons of Erdogan. Erdogan is like 358 hours. Uh, it would take you, you could. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you know that number? <laughs> because somebody recommended it and I was like, how long is this show? It's 358 hours. Oh what are you, insane? So it's 358 shows. 358 move. It's, it's, it's two hour movies, 172 Episodes or 79 episodes. Mind you, look, I don't mean to hate on the show or anything, but half the show is the guy riding on a horse. <laughs> Bro, fast forward to that. <laughs> you, you, yo, you know, you, you know what's you, crazy? You're laughing because you know it's true. You know what's <laughs> crazy? All the all the Salafis are so into that show. Right? Are they really? Yeah, and then like everybody's into a show, right? And all, all these selfie people posting about how cool the show is. And What's their excuse for the hu- for the hadras and stuff? Uh, I just I put up a status. I'm like, you know, manhaj by <laughs> uh, <laughs> manhaj while it's day, and then Erdogan at night. You know. I mean, the show is. It, but how can Salafis be into that show? The show is super Sufi. It's pre- That's what it's, I mean. It's uh, <laughs> they make excuses for it. By the way, Salafis love that stuff because he was mujahid. Yeah. Peace and they don't actually have anyone in their history that they can <laughs> claim that from. Well, Ibn Taymiyyah, he did uh, fight. I mean, he's not. He's he was not Salafi. Ibn Taymiyyah would repudiate modern day Salafis. Ibn Taymiyyah, though, actually. To be fair. And I've been having a discussion with some Hanbali scholars that he actually parted with Hanbalis in the idea of discussing Kalam, period. Right. Because the Hanabila, they say we abstain from the entire discussion of metaphysics and Kalam and all that. Well, Ibn Taymiyyah says, no, I'm entering the discussion and I'm actually under. I don't believe. I don't agree with the metaphysics. Of the shadow, how the shadow viewed the world right. in the first place, right? So anyway, that's a whole right. other discussion. But the idea that there are Hanabila is different, in a sense, from uh, the followers of Ibn Taymiyyah in, in that respect. Yeah. In entering that dis- that field and that discussion, um, I couldn't. I want to. It seems outrageous for 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 us to allow people who reject for, for a long time rejected Madahab, although now they've come around finally. Congratulations, mm-hmm. and who continue to re- reject the sawuf in its pure form to claim someone who is a madhabi Sufi of the Qadri order. order. Yeah. Like, give me a break. Yeah. Are you, it's not acceptable. Yeah. Like, you guys agree with him on one thing, and you probably misunderstood him on that. <laughs> well, like, you so know what? Even on his aqidah, you probably so misunderstood So going him. back to the 350 hours of our thru. <laughs> right. It's insane. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean... Earth rule is one thing. I mean, people spend ridiculous amounts of time just on Twitter. Most of Muslim Twitter should get off of it and, and read some Quran. Well, to be practical, to be practical, a man came to me, a parent came to me the other day, and they said, my son memorized Quran, and he listened, but I can't get him to stop listening to music. So I was like, well, you know, uh, we know the rules on, rulings on music. And she was like, yeah, he's into Bach and Beethoven. I was like, you know what? Actually, we know the rulings on music, but to be practical, if that's what he's into, that's far less alarming, right, right. than if he was into some other things. Right. But at the same time, so it's, it's in the same time, there are rulings and there are objective analyses, but there is practicality where <laughs> if you're going to have a teenager or even an adult watching, they're going to watch Netflix anyway. 
Right. You want them watching HBO and watching uh, no. Game of Thrones oh, of with all the yeah. pornography on it? Of course. So yeah. practically speaking, and you're always talking about practicality. And of course. We're mm-hmm. living in this life. So we don't take it from we're living in the sewer, but now next, just read Quran. Well, you got to have a gradation, a of gradation course, here, right? And and Erterol is a great step up. Right? Oh no no no! I'm, sure. I'm, I'm sure. I'm saying it's. I'm not. I'm. I'm just hating on the show. No, there's a there's hate, an, I hate on everything. There's but. another <laughs> thing. There's one thing about Erterol which, uh, uh, which it took me about a year to know that there's no G, to be pronounced. But, but it, it, yeah. in, if you look at the Osmanli Arabic, it's Rain. Rain. It's Rain in there. Okay. It silent or no? I mean, wh- how's it silent Rain? No idea. <laughs> they probably couldn't <laughs> pronounce it, so they just skipped you it. Say Arturo. Anyway, listen. Yeah. There's one thing about this that is uh, uh, one thing about it that's uh, brings something to the table that nothing else does. It's the idea of Muslims exerting their willpower. Mm. Right? Here's a guy. He's not saying, okay, let's just leave the Seljuks to do their job. Let's just move over because the Mongols are here. The Christians are there. Well, we got empires. Let them do their. Job. He's like, you're all fools. I'm doing this myself. Right, and he goes out and he fights and he does this. Where else have you seen? When was the last time you seen Muslims exerting willpower? No, no, nothing. But I, I think she- all that stuff is great. Time out. I'm not done. <laughs> 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 okay. I'm telling you, the interruption is a disaster. But listen, when I saw that first episode and I watched one episode, one season, uh, one there was one scene where they're fighting the Crusaders, like an extreme group of Crusaders, and they're fighting this they're in this palace, and they win. They defeated the Crusaders. And it's the thing is, you don't know what that is. I, I blurted out. I was like, oh, that's what Muslims' victory looks like? <laughs> I've never seen it, right? That's never true. seen it. That's true. When we're going now five, six generations of Muslims who have never, ever seen the Muslims win a battle, a war. A battle or a war. Like, we lose the war, right? It's like we lose the series, and we lost every game in the series. Mm. And we got shut out in every game. That's the reality. And now our teammates are scoring against us now. That's the only time Muslims win is when they're fighting other Muslims. Yeah, no, and, no, and and our and our rulers are like the UAE, King Sa- uh, Saudi Arabia, all MB, MBZ, MBS. These guys, they're shooting on the own goal. Yeah, they're not even. It's not even that they stink. KSA just pledged like a hundred million to Modi. Hundred million to Modi. I mean, they're, they're it's not. So they're openly wow. shooting against, playing against us now. So we're not. So we went from we lost the series. Fine, you could lose a seven game series, close game, but you can go. You can get swept. In the series, we get shut out. Now, right, we don't even know who our teammates are. They're openly against us. By the way, you can only be surprised by KSA giving $100 billion to India if you've never paid attention to why Palestine is still in that condition. Yeah, there's no you surprise think this game is This is the same game that's been going on. Like, yeah. the, the, the Muslims with the capability did not support the Palestinians ever. You were going to say so. Oh, I was going to say in terms Bach of faith. Um, yeah. Um, you know, one of my favorite quotes from uh, Sheikh Noah about music is that what music is, instrumental music like that, is the is is just a pure distillation of a, of the mu- of the composer's nafs. Like you express it in a way through music that you couldn't even express it in words, right? You get a broader range of expression. And why would you open up your nafs to the nafs of a of a of a kafir? Wow. So you wow. that instrumental music is probably worse. That just mm. blew my mind. You might be better off listening to pop music or rap. No, but that pop music is worse nafs. They're shaitanic. Yeah, but they're not getting to your soul. Th- That's why it drops yeah. off quickly. You don't think so? He has That's a why very it, good it point. disappears yeah. in Wait a few it, months. Time and then out. it's a new one. Did time you out. ever hear dubstep? Time out. <laughs> I'm not. I don't know what that is. Right? <laughs> <laughs> is that like Irish uh, folk music or something? <laughs> no, it's it's but just intr- instrumental. But it's like you when you hear it, you feel physically uncomfortable. No, but these people who listen to pop music, they go astray in two seconds, right? I mean, yeah. that is, there's no comparison. When you listen to, I mean, you, have you seen youth? Yeah. W- when they and when they're listening to pop music, they're going off the deep end real fast, right? As opposed to someone who's listening to something classical. Yeah. Right. I've never seen someone go to classical, go into drugs, into Zena, into mm-hmm. blah, 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 Instagram. Well, so right? let's, let's examine this on a societal level here without any actual numbers or studies. Yeah. Who, who are we talking about who's listening to the better music, right? The classical music? Yeah. It's usually the, the very well-educated, the well off The people who are the foundation of all the fitna in our society. <laughs> Yeah. The people who who, I, who support who go well, we have we should have libraries and we should have in our libraries we should have like transsexuals coming and reading to the kids like that's not the youth listening to like 
uh, Britney Spears, that's the people who sit around in their, you know, oak libraries yeah. listening to the great uh, classical composers. To, uh, to be honest. They have no morals. I don't know anyone except this one kid who listens to. Right. So I wouldn't be able to say. But it's I it's mean the people from the, in the halls of power. Yeah. And you know how they are. Yeah. Big shit team. Yeah. That's, the, the, that's the shayateen of the intellect as opposed to the shayateen of the temptations it's, the, it's but no but they're also the shayateen that are doing the big drugs they're the ones that are doing the the, pe- the the tons of cocaine that get smuggled in they're the ones that are having those wild part it's it's people epstein's crowd mm. epstein's crowd so, so that Point. so that got real meta for me but i'm just gonna what's that mean <laughs> what does that mean well you guys are taking saying words i don't understand meta dubstep <laughs> wait a minute <laughs> am i meta meaning grand meta meaning uh he it's big <laughs> no no, no <laughs> self-referential <laughs> never heard this before never heard this before when you go home today google dubstep no no and google no no, 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 no. google meta 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 meanings fit like beyond like self-referential so. right no but meta is supposed to be beyond like metaphysics beyond right physics. his explanation of the classical <laughs> music was too meta for me yeah. <laughs> do we have a topic for today yes we do okay let's so go that's what i was gonna get back to is Google dubstep. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I was going to get back to is, you know, talking about the importance of the Quran. Because one thing you mentioned, uh, right, that that middle ground between, like, for example, watching Ertrul and and you know people instead of you know watching whatever else they may be watching, it's like this brings them sort of halfway. Because you can't expect people to go, you know, to not reciting Quran and and you know I, I'm saying people in the past used to recite it eight times a day and doing a khatam. I mean, this is an extreme example, but I only I only kind of gave that as a to, to demonstrate that it, it, it's one it's humanly possible mm-hmm. right and two obviously we're not going to be like the sahaba right they're obviously the sahaba for a reason uh, but I think you don't even need to look that far right I guarantee if you just go back one generation in your family you know you'll find plenty of people who recited the Quran at length for, for you know extreme periods of time mm-hmm. I mean unless you're a convert or you know you come from a different type of background but um, <laughs> for, for, for the record, I shaking, was shaking my head when you were saying that. Head, but uh, um, I, for 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 a lot of people, right? Okay. Um, you you can bring this example up, and and I've always wondered why this has happened, right? And it's I know you can say it's like oh you know kids don't understand the Quran and they're not given an explanation and and et cetera et cetera et cetera, but that's not the case with like I know I can speak about my mother for example she doesn't exp- understand the Quran at all. Can I tell you one of the reasons why? When environments are clean, uh, fitra is intact, recitation of the Quran feels good. People recite because it feels great, right? And if any time that anyone has been in a pure environment, for example, you fasted Ramadan by day 20, you've been very clean, right? By day 25, you start feeling like you're not just reciting by force. There is a great sweetness to the recitation, to the exposure to dhikrullah. And... There was a time, way you know, not too long ago, where environments were clean. Uh, the eyes were not as polluted, ears were not as polluted, uh, food was pure, a lot of purity was Money, there. My income was pure. Income was pure. Hearts were clean, so it responds better to the revelation. And, and I think it's it's the the society is there too, right? I mean, nowadays you walk into a store and you might have you know heard a song and that kind of s- that song sticks with you even as you walk out the door. I'm sure many people in the past, even if they were like thieves, sat around in thicker gatherings just coincidentally, and then they, you know they they remember the thicker. Well, there's also uh, that's what there was to do. Right, uh, right. It was just like a thing, right? And it wasn't even like, oh, you know, this person yeah. is reciting Quran like it's, that's normal. It's yeah. uh, I'm telling you, uh, Sheikh Abdul Basit, he. Uh, he was inspired to become a reciter because he would go to the local coffee shop and he heard Sheikh Muhammad Rifat on the radio. Mm. And How do you know this? This is I old Egyptian school I stuff. I love Abdul Basit. Yeah. Um, so he would walk every single day, like uh, almost like uh, thir- 40, almost an hour, right? Just to go to the coffee shop to listen to Sheikh Muhammad Rifat, right? On the radio? Or on the radio. Okay. And uh, the reason is because the society around you, like let's say you were in India, let's say you were in Bangladesh or uh, Egypt, there was a great reverence for the Quran, uh, even for just the recitation of it, right? It, you know, you could criticize saying, oh, those societies, they didn't uh, teach kids how to understand. But people, like, really loved reciting the Quran and listening to it. Well, but you, mm-hmm. you come to the, sorry to cut no, you off, no, okay. you come to the U.S., you got kids, I'm telling you, some of my students in Sunday school, a uh, uh, 10-year-old watching YouTube, right? And then he's quoting, oh, you know why Einstein uh, was so smart? 
uh, because I'm just like, where did you get that? Yeah. Right. And then, be, uh, you know, he was watching YouTube. So you get those types of kids who are watching YouTube. They're listening to rap music, right, from the age of like six onwards. Whoa. And you bring them to a Quran school, like it, it's not going to affect your heart. It's a culture. It's a culture. Everything's yeah. got to be a culture. And that's why we need uh, what we don't need is we don't need a big hero or super achievers, but we need a thick middle class mm -hmm. to establish cultures in homes, masajid, schools, if they go to a Muslim school. Uh, afternoon and weekend schools if they go to that but it's got to be a culture and it's norms right so the idea of reciting Quran that means someone walks in on you and you're reciting Quran now tell me even in a Muslim home right if you were to go in a middle class Muslim maybe British maybe Australian home and the the man is sitting reciting Quran or his wife is sitting reciting Quran right there might be a take like is there is this the time for a bad we're about to have dinner right there's stuff to do the kids have homework there's stuff is this a time for this but now flip it the guy's on his treadmill right now it's different it's like okay alhamdulillah he's taking care of his body he's got to look good for his <laughs> wife right so there are social norms society has made us may uh, normalize taking care of our body Mm -hmm. Right. Think of the hours that Americans put in. I don't, I don't know about other cultures, if this is in Australia, but fitness culture is a craze in the world right now. Absolutely. Right. I think it's a pretty much a good thing. But it, but compare it to uh, recitation or ibadah. It's very similar. Right. But except that one is seen, one is a visible thing mm -hmm. and one's an invisible thing. Right. One is something where we could see the results right away and we like the result and we encourage it. And there are a lot of institutions encouraging it. Now, recitation of Quran, it's more subtle, right? The improvement of the individual will be seen, but it's a lot more subtle. And it's his character, not his body. Mm. Yeah. But also, there are some, for the people that go, oh, these people that are reciting without understanding, they're just, you know, there's some spiritual benefit and maybe in the next life, but there's so much more. Like a, a household where people recite Quran on a regular basis, even if they're doing a hizb, which is like a quarter of a juz, right? Every day. There's going to be less sinning in that house. You're just not going to be a sinful person. You're not. You just won't go. To, you won't go to bed if you're not in Gosso because you're going to recite Quran before you go to bed. Like simple things that are practical, material, realistic, and they have a known, quantifiable effect in this life. Yeah. So there's no argument to be made on that side. Besides that, yeah, more people should uh, learn to understand it. Yeah. I think another thing that that gets to people in in modern times is there is no because of the infinite nature of the Quran. Because it never really ends, there is no f like end point, mm -hmm. right? Where there's like an accomplished task of you know I've done this and I've completed it. For example, the the salah, you know, people pray the salah because it's like okay, this is a, a thing that you need to get done in the day, and it's part of this checklist, and it's it, it makes you more productive. Like oh, I'm a productive individual. I've even read all my salah, right? Or it's like um, the Quran. Whereas right, you know, just reading for hours and hours and hours because of the infinite nature of it. It doesn't fit in with this modern paradigm of you know productivity. Well, the Sahaba did have a concept of awrad, mm. hizb, right? right? So even the Prophet Sallallahu said, uh, if you miss your hizb, then you can recite it before the Dhuhr. It'll count for the previous day. So the uh, wird of Quran it was either you know a portion, whatever you know the juz and hizbs. There are thirty juz. Each juz is divided into two hizbs, sixty hizbs. This came later. This ajzat came later. But why did they make it into thirty juz to match the month? Right, mm. because it's the, the Sahaba, the Prophet Sallallahu has the Hadith recite the Quran in a month. Right, so that's a Hadith. That's why we have thirty evenly demarcated ajzat. So this concept of if we need a goal, the goal would be a month. But some people could not do a month, so they would do two months. Mm. So that's where the hizbs came in, so that you can read a hizb a day. And a hizb a day, if you read Arabic, will take you twenty, fifteen, not even take you ten minutes. Right? It'll literally take you 10 minutes. You know the amount of ads that you'll watch on YouTube that won't allow you to skip? <laughs> right? You won't, can't skip 12 seconds or something or 5 seconds? You probably spend more time watching Grammarly ads than. <laughs> right? Yeah. If you listen to a one hour podcast yeah. per week, that's the equivalent of 10 10 minute sessions of Quran. Mm -hmm. Uh, hour and a half, whatever, 90 minutes, hour, yeah. whatever our podcasts are. Most people, uh, that's great advice for somebody who knows how to read the Quran. And it's not a, a lot of effort for them to read the Arabic, right? 
most people what happens is you know when you're trying to learn a new language and you don't you can't you're stuttering all the time mm -hmm. so when you're reading it you get exhausted because you're constantly fixing yourself you're stuttering you're doing this and that and so you feel frustrated about it right yeah. and most people their level of Quran reading is at that level and the problem with that is they think that improvement is going to take so much of their time. No, oh, they should but still do the 10 minutes a day. They, they should still do the 10 minutes a day. And I'm telling Even you right now. Even if it only gets them like yeah, half a page. From personal experience, uh, the only way you can improve your reading of the Quran is consistency. If you recite consist uh, consistently, if you're reciting two pages a day consistently. The or snowsberries one page taste a day, like snowsberries? The, what is it? <laughs> the only way to read Quran is to read Quran. <laughs> I'm telling you to improve it, right? Yeah. To improve it. But people are, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, they for some reason they don't want to put in that work. Yeah. Uh, I have an, one of my uncles, so he recites a juz of Quran every day in the morning, Allah. in the transliteration in Hindi because mm. he can't read Arabic, right? Wow. So he he'll have the Arabic on the side and he'll try to glance at it whenever he can, mm. but he'll recite the entire juz every single day. He's been doing it for the last twenty nine years, <laughs> right? In transliteration. I spent a lot of time with a transliteration right? of wow. of juz amma. So I mean yeah. for. I know that this is it's it's an excuse, right? We we it's like you say it's like oh I can't read the Arabic I can't understand. There's people who read it in translation and transliteration, uh, and, and still manage to do it, right? I, the only thing I'm gonna say is that the real answer to all this is that people are lazy, and there's no other answer to it. People are just lazy. I, I have a different answer, right? Yeah, well you're uh, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, li well, listen there to give people a piece of a practical advice. Yeah. One of the best ways to learn to speed up your recitation and to avoid what you're saying, that uh, frustration and whatnot, is, okay, let's say you know your, the Arabic letters, right? Mm. You know what they look like. You know the tashkil. So you pick one surah. Let's say surah al bayyina okay? And you just listen to it over and over and over and over and over. Bayina. Yeah. And there was a point in time when I was in uh, teaching at Trinity and Harford Seminar, all these places, and, I, and the iPod. Nanos had just come out, mm -hmm. right? Maybe they came out before and I wasn't up to date, right? But s they got me a, my f yeah, an iPod Nano, right? And I put the Quran on it. I would actually keep it in my ear, right? I would keep the earbuds in my ear and I keep it on loop and I would lock it the entire day, even teaching the class. <laughs> because I felt that there's so much ghafla, right? There's so much heedlessness and darkness that I need to <laughs> counterbalance it. So I would have the whole juz. I'm telling you, while I'm in office hours, while teaching, uh, the only time I removed it is if I had to go to the bathroom. But the idea is, listen to the same surah, then open the Quran and recite it. You'll see, you'll have so memorized so it. This right. is a good point, and I'm sorry to interject, but it's the wrong. So our our brother Harun posted and wrote an article about studying in Egypt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he said is prepping yourself is listening to Quran uh, at work when you're in America before you start going. Spend as much time with the Quran as you can. Just playing it on a loop while you're at work in your headphones, which is exactly what you're saying. And some people had a question, and they were like, "Isn't that impermissible? Like you're not, you're ignoring it. You're the Quran is playing in the background. You're not actually paying attention to it." Mm -hmm. So there are circumstances in which that's permissible and uh, recommended. Yes, and actually, I thought about that too. But I thought to myself that, you know, this is actually like almost like I felt it was a dire state almost, right? Mm -hmm. Like I need to have this in my ears at all times. And okay, maybe if I had put adhkar, it would remove myself from that. Haraj, if I had put Athkar, but honestly, I would honestly really believe by the end of the day, I f would feel polished off, and I would mm -hmm. literally fall asleep like a baby. And when your when your heart's polished off, you fall asleep like a baby, mm -hmm. right? And just to finish this topic, that's that's a modern. This is an ishtihadi ruling, right? Because unless you were a king or something, it's uh -huh. not like you could command reciters yeah. back in the days and be like, recite in the background exactly, while I yeah. do this other thing. That's right? true. Yeah. So, like, this is just an audio. It's a modern technology thing. There's yeah. another thing, too. I would sleep with it. And this is not good because, well, now you have the AirPods, but it, sometimes it gets wrapped up mm -hmm. around your neck. So, youth should not do this. But I used to do it. I used to put the iPod under my bed, mm -hmm. right? Under my pillow, I mean. And I would listen to it through the night. I'm not kidding. Through the night. And you would have amazing dreams sometimes, mm -hmm. right? You would literally have amazing dreams. And I'm telling you, there's something else that... Sometimes the, the earpiece would fall off, but you don't know it fell off. You still hear someone reciting to you in your dream. Mm. You wake up, the earpiece is way off. And that's because Allah. it's like Malaika took over the recitation. And, and someone once asked, what, what is it when someone hears dhikrullah in a dream? 
some and I heard the response was malaika reciting to the person, mm. right? Wow. So so I'm telling you, this was if you do this on a regular basis and those are my best days mm. living in the absolute death trap rat hole of Merritt in Connecticut. <laughs> and that's how I made it. By the way, and if you if if you do this method of falling asleep with the Quran or with Askar and you're not having you're having like bad dreams or something, this is good. Keep going mm-hmm. because um, what 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 no, no what uh, what uh, what I was told is that you know your heart is like anything else, right? It has it's dirty, it's rusty, it's covered up, right? And you're not. It's like a vessel that has mud in it, right? You start pouring the water in. Mm. You're not going to pour a glass of wa- you're not going to pour a shot of water into the glass and all of a sudden it's clean. It's still dirt. Eventually that dirt will become mud and the mud will start getting lighter and lighter and lighter until what's out flowing out of it is just pure water. But you have to keep pouring that water in or else you're just going to ha- keep having dirt. So keep at it and eventually you'll have the good dreams. Yeah. Uh, and this is the same type of phenomenon. This probably sounds a bit esoteric, but like you know if you start doing dhikr for the first time ever, exactly right? the same yeah. thing. You'll you'll sort of have like a constriction on your heart. You're mm-hmm. starting to feel really weird. It's like oh I should stop. You know why am I feeling weird? You know it's I'm not feeling good. And then it's it's because of this rust being removed. You know and anybody who's actually started doing dhikr knows exactly what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, and you know, the, the, there's that famous line of poetry from Imam Shafi, right, where his teacher says. Uh, Indeed, the knowledge of uh, knowledge from Allah is light, and light doesn't go to mm. the, the center. That was so from a teacher, Wakia. Yeah. So Ibn Jarrah. And then uh. the the thing is, uh, sorry to cut you off. The mm. the thing is, uh, by the way, did you? I read an article that you studied Arabic like later on in life, right, Shir? Well, I've I was uh, raised speaking colloquial Arabic. Okay. But I studied the grammar. Yeah. And learned the grammar in my late teens. I guarantee you all that listening to Quran is what made it like so easy. Oh, I'm telling you that, and yeah. and just reciting. So I would I would say I pretty much without effort just by reading like any mm-hmm. Muslim youth yeah. have picked up a decent vocab word, yeah. decent amount. And also you picked up what an idafa is. Yeah, the idea exactly. of the idafa. You don't know what it's called, but you you also know that noun and adjectives mm-hmm. have to match yeah. mm-hmm. in in everything in their yeah. uh, alif lam or not in their tashkid, etc., etc. And I'm Chomsky telling, talks yeah. about this. Grammar is actually innate to the human being. Yeah. Yeah, so when you learn a language, you learn the grammar without knowing the rules. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's so many people today that um, they're very passionate about learning Arabic, right? Because they, they realize... See, one of the, the... When I disagree with Alex here, I think one of the reasons people don't want to... their distance away from the Quran is that there's this culture of instant gratification and they don't see the Quran as something valuable enough to spend all their time. Because... Uh, there's a quote that I recently read The Quran is a jealous book right? Meaning when you want to put your time into it uh, One of my friends told me You give all of yourself to the Quran The Quran gives a part of itself to you yeah. right? And so, But there's a lot of value in it right? And people don't understand that It's the speech of Allah And you're connecting with Allah when you're reading it But one of the reasons People want to learn Arabic They want to connect with Allah They want to uh, understand what Allah is saying uh-huh. But they go to an Arabic class and by the second, third week, everybody's gone. It takes effort. And most of the effort, most of the problem is because they can't read, right? They're, they're struggling through Arabic text, right? Like even with the tashkil. And the reason for that is they're not reading Quran. So like mm. it all goes back to the Quran. Like you want to learn Arabic? Show me that you could put in the discipline by reading Quran, right? So what you're so, pointing is a great point, which is that liturgical worship yeah. which is worship from a, from books prayer books whether it's the, it's the Quran it's going to be Adhkar of the morning and the evening that makes your eye always look at that absolutely letter, those yeah. letters and I'm telling you uh, I remember Aurad people who are saying Aurad and I'm telling like people who are maybe converts or otherwise that were they weren't knowledge folk you mm-hmm. can you, they were lovers Muhibbin like they're called Muhibbin right they love the good but the, and they kept Aurad they actually learned mm-hmm. Arabic, not yeah. Arabic as in grammar, but they could read letter yeah, words, yeah, signs, the uh, book titles, right? From what reading the wirid of the morning and the wirid of the evening, right? right? right. So that awrad and liturgical, yeah. like you're saying, is really powerful. Yeah, and that's why one of the big things with this uh, Arabic movement uh, among American Muslims of you know learn Quranic Arabic, right? But what they never tell you is you have to first read the Quran. You have to first read it every single day. If you really want to actually start learning Arabic and reading things, if you can't read the Quran every single day, how are you going to get through Arabic class? It's, yeah. it's not possible. Right? And that's, that's actually the, the thing I find the most interesting is that there is this huge movement to you know, learn to read Arabic so that I can learn to understand the Quran. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful, mashallah, and I hope it grows and continues. 
but I find it even more interesting that actually less people read the Quran now because I, I don't know if it's a it's a, there's a correlation between I, this or not. But uh, I honestly think uh, the, it all goes back to Steve Jobs. He really did a number on all of us <laughs> with the technology, with the iPhone. I yeah. mean, think about this. I mean, of course, you, you got to do your best in whatever field you are, and he did his best. And he did an amazing job. No, but it. he knew what he was doing because he didn't let his kids use it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and I remember myself, I would listen on the bus. I would do all, in England, I would do all my recitation on the bus. Going to, co- to school was a 15, 20 minute ride, seven minutes at the bus stop. It's 22 minutes, right? It's going to be 22 minutes, right? Uh, however, way you cut it, you recite at the bus, at the bus stop, and on the bus, right? Uh, you finish your recitation. Uh, you come on the way back. There's a little bit of traffic. You finish your recitation. You fall asleep. You arrive home. You're refreshed, right? You've done your recitation. You're falling asleep. You're in a good mood. Now, fast forward, right? Everyone's on their phone the entire time. And the phone also deprives sleep because it keeps your brain racing but not moving, right? So I remember some people saying, oh, but a man, if I'm going to pull the Quran out, I was like, and people are going to look at me. I was like, what do you care? Who cares? What do you Angels mean? Angels are going to look at you. Huh? Angels are going to look Madaka. at you. Yeah, I remember a brother saying to me, it's gonna, isn't it weird to pull out the Quran in front of people? Why? He's like, what do you care? What? what? You're, you're never going to see these strangers again. Yeah. And I'm like, we're talking in, uh, amongst people who are, you know, coming in heels. Yeah. Guys coming in heels and stuff like that. Uh, they I don't care. Mean, these are the same people. You, you'll find people making out on the bus and they don't care. Yeah. yeah. I'm work, reading the ri- words uh, the of words God, of Allah, yeah. right? Exactly. I, I work in, I work in, I work in the, at the judiciary in a government <laughs> office. And on my bookshelf, I keep a Quran. Yeah. Like on my it's bookshelf, Quran. visibly, right? Where yeah. people and it says the Quran. <laughs> 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 so, like, what are you worried about on the bus, strangers? These yeah. are the. I'm. I'm. This is in front of like. I'm the only Muslim in that building. Yeah. And this is in front of like, you know, people that are in a conservative part of the state. Mm. And there's nothing to worry about. Yeah. And it's my employer. Mm. Why are you worried about it? In, in yeah. Come on, man. And what do you care what strangers think of you? Yeah. Strangers, you'll never see them again. <laughs> Do you ha- what else do you have from this book? Because I have something. If you're done with that, but but give me. You have anything else in that? While you're looking through there, I'll just. Yeah. What I do to go to sleep nowadays is um, start with a surah that I've memorized and translate it back, translate it from Arabic to. I was doing it to English, but it was getting too easy, so I was done doing it to Spanish, mm. and I'm done in like four hours. Tomorrow. From from laying my head on the pillow to falling asleep. Because yeah. you're 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 like you're actually relaxing your mind, even though you're really yeah. working it. Yeah. yeah. You're doing something difficult with your mind, but it, it just completely relaxes. So I fall asleep to Quran every day, but yeah. it's my own recitation in my. And the uh, the one of the best ways to fall asleep is reading anything. Number yeah. one, right. especially stories of the awliya or uh, anything uh, good of Islam uh, and with a mention of Allah in it, mm. because reading in general the page puts you to sleep. Mm-hmm. Number one, uh, and it'll, you'll doze off into a nice sleep. If you're reading something good, obviously that's better. If if it in good meaning, it has the name of Allah in it. Um, read or giving tasmiya of everything you know, right? Like, let's say you know just Amma, recite it. Uh, in Mauritania, there was a man who took a bus trip. His job was to take a bus trip from Nuakshot to the tent of Murabat al Hajj. And the bus driver, six hour trip, the bus driver was reciting Quran the entire time. Oh, wow. and, and think about this the absence of stuff, there, the radio. You think the radio works in the, the <laughs> radio? <laughs> right? Yeah. There's no radio. There's no cell phone, right? There's no distraction. So, but the absence of these things can be a blessing because what else do you have to do? It's true. Recite the Quran. Like, li- if you so ask, he was doing a khatam every day just at his job. He was probably doing a khatam or two a day just driving the bus back and forth. And and if anyone who has done memorization, if you're in the, sometimes you're on memorization, sometimes you're off it. But anytime you're on it, and you can recite three juz, two juz, one juz at a time it really changes your heart mm-hmm. you're the state of your and our and we're not we're sort of i would i want i want to say that we should be sort of a type of movement in a sense but it's not a movement that has a specific end in sight except to transform our generation to make it a strong generation in which we have habits right habits like and this is, should be one of our habits and it should be our habit till we die and we should transmit it to our kids and to our friends and to our uh, neighbors and, and you know community members, right? We should be someone who has uses. And this is what I'm saying about willpower. Many people misunderstood some post I made the other day about revolutions, right? It's just about using, your, making a difference. 
in whatsoever way that you can and persisting. And one of the biggest difference we should make is returning ourselves and our friends and communities masajid back to the book of Allah. Right. You know, there's nothing better than a masjid that has a kids Quran program. You go in there and you hear all this these honeybees, right? Their kids memorizing the Quran and reciting their honeybees in the masjid. This is a blessed community, right? You know, until you start hitting yeah. them with sticks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, and one of the things Imam Nawawi mentions there, talking about sticks, is the the teacher of the Quran has to be soft and um, uh, very good to the the students yeah. because uh, when somebody's learning the Quran, especially if they're a little kid. If they get tra- see one of the biggest problems is people get traumatized with the Quran when they're young. That's, that's bad, right? That's bad. It's it's really bad. And and the thing is that you're doing so much harm because you're actually traumatizing a person from the speech of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that will actually help them later in their life. There you is know? there is a give and take. There is a pros and cons in that. Yeah. Uh, I've heard many 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 adults say, "I would have never." memorize anything if my parents had to push me so there is a part of that that there is there is a push needed right of course i yeah. mean every doctor in the world their parent pushed them in school mm-hmm. no one was self-motivated to go to eighth yeah. grade right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 right so there is an element for yeah. you know uh to be fair about that but it should there should be a limit it Absolutely. really has to be and has to be and how do you limit it by Balancing it out. Yeah. Right. I, th- I mean, there's there's obviously a difference between discipline and roughness, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you have to be disciplined, but that doesn't mean you you know you, you traumatize yeah. you know, children wherever. <laughs> there, I mean, be. there was a video recently of this. Uh, this, I don't want to mention the group, but <laughs> you probably know. Uh, <laughs> uh, this person like hitting this kid with like a like a pipe. Right? This is real or is this... <laughs> it's, uh, it's real. It's not act, funny, but it's funny. Is it acting on memory TV or no, is it No, no, no. It's, it's like real. And and to me, I'm just like, you know, the Quran should be like the main event, right? It should be like, you know how everybody, you know, there's somebody famous or some, uh, something very, very popular, right? And everybody goes to it. The Quran should be like that. I mean, uh, uh, I was reading um, uh, Ingrid Madsen's book on the story of the Quran. And she was talking about how back in the day people would celebrate when people would become hafiz. Yeah. So uh, mm-hmm. there was the story in Mecca that, that this traveler, and then he saw that, oh, everybody's like throwing a party in Mecca. And then he went towards this crowd with like thousands and thousands of people. And then there was the stage. And then on top of the stage uh, were these children. And then one of the, ch- uh, one of the child, uh, he was giving a talk, right? And then he realized that, oh, this is an entire celebration of the entire city because they're hufat. Mashallah. So, like, the Quran should be our main event. Yeah. It should be something that people get excited for. And just to give you a hadith, um, uh, the Prophet says that the difference between uh, Allah's speech and regular speech is like the difference between Allah and His creation. Subhanallah. And right? Yeah. And the, there, you finished? Yeah, I mean, oh, I was going to mention one more where yeah. Allah says, um, uh, the Prophet says, Allah has family from among mm. uh, creation. Yeah. And, uh, um, uh, the f- the people of Quran are the select family of Allah. Yeah, Ahlul Quran. Ahlullah. Ahlullah. So, if this is in motivation, I don't know. What well, that's is. the idea behind the Bismillah and the Amin, and that. And I used to think like the Arabs always have a different view because we don't have anything called Bismillah party and Amin party, mm. and they always have this smart aleck thing. Is like, what's the party about? Oh, he's going to open the. He's going to start reciting Quran, or what's the Amin about? Have memorize the Quran? No, he finished recitation of the Quran, yeah. and the Arabs will always make some comments like, that's a big deal, but it is a big. <laughs> deal. It's a great event. Those yeah. events are wonderful. Exactly. It's firstly. You're gathering the people for food. You gather the community. Secondly, you elevate in the other side of other kids, the Quran, right? Mm. Not only that, I've heard a lot of people who, Arabs, yeah. native born, who don't recite Quran correctly. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, this kid finished the Quran with Tajweed. Yeah. <laughs> so, have you ever done that in your life? Yeah, right? Your kids probably haven't. <laughs> Speaking right. of the culture of teachers, like you said, it is uh, the highly recommended, and it's the culture of Quran memorizers, especially in Egypt, very soft. However, the Tajweed teacher, when you grow up and you're mature and you're ready to hear, learn the rules of Tajweed, they are strict, mm-hmm. right? Tajweed teachers, man. We had a Syrian lady. She's teaching uh, Tajweed in the masjid. Oh, my gosh. I'm cringing at what she's saying, right? What is this? Zali. What is Zali? <laughs> 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 she's going off on these poor aunties that are like 60 years old and she's trying to bend her tongue and move her yeah, mouth. Yeah. But, Meanwhile, hey, that's what works. But meanwhile, she's probably like, either ja. 
<laughs> that Syrian accent. I have something uh, that I prepared here. Are we ready for this? Okay. Go for it. Uh, another aspect of the Quran, al ilaj bil Quran, right? Seeking cures using certain verses of the Quran. Now, some people say that uh, you know, is this really true? Well, the answer is that Allah says in the Quran, "When unazilu min al Quran, ma huwa shifa wa rahmatun lil mu'minin." So this ayah says, "We reveal from the Quran what is a medicine, a shifa, a cure, and a mercy to the believers." So in this type, this ayah, it doesn't say all of the Quran is a shifa, right? It says some of the Quran. This is called min litabaid. You know min litabaid, Naz, right? It, it's min for the purpose of the part, right? The, the, the word min is for the part. It means from it. Not all of it, from it. So that means there. Now, why would Allah tell us there are some verses of the Quran for healing, right? Not others. And then keep it a mystery. No. He, he told us this, and the ulama have done it jihad on which ayat, and sometimes it's very clear, and sometimes it's, very, it's not. Okay, But the idea, that's the first evidence. This ayah by itself is enough of an evidence. Right. The other evidence is that some sahaba use their own ijtihad, and of course we know the ijtihad of sahaba is going to be accepted, to cure certain things, such as snake bites. Mm-hmm. Right. So, not only the Quran they used, but they used any fluid that was associated with that recitation so for example one tribe one time the muslims were out sahaba were out and they came upon a non-believing tribe and they said let us stay with us we're on a long journey and it was getting dark and it was like a a storm that was about to come and this tribe said no we don't want muslims here (coughs) so leave so they left abu sa'id al-khudri radiallahu ta'ala was in that group and he uh they left so they went to sleep at the edge of a mountain now, a uh, little, some while later, a man came running and he said, we heard that amongst you is someone who knows ruqya, healing. And back then they don't have a lot of medicine, so they're looking for anything. Our chief has just been bitten by a scorpion. So he ran back. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri ran back. Okay. And he held his, the man's leg where he was bit by a scorpion. And he would recite Surah Al-Fatiha and spit on the man's, the wound. Recite Surah Fatiha and spit on the wood. Surah so Fatiha spit on the wood. And eventually the man, the the pain went away and the effect went away. Right? Now listen to this part too. The man said, thank you. He said, where's my fee? <laughs> <laughs> right? So there are so many things in this. Right? They, the fee was, you, we spent, he said, what, what do you want? Now that you've done this for me, I have to give you something. Right? He said, we want to spend the night and one sheep. Right, so we can eat it later on. He agreed. They went. The Sahaba were split. That were with him were split. Should we eat from this? Never heard of anyone reciting doing what you did and taking money off of it. Right? They went back to the Prophet ﷺ. They said Abu Sa'id Khudri did this, this, and this, and then he asked for money for it. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ smiled and he said, "Call me Abu Sa'id." Right? <laughs> so he said. He brought him in front of everyone. He said, and what? who told you that Fatiha was a ruqya? Like, where'd you get this knowledge from? I didn't never said Fatiha was a ruqya, right? He said, ru'iya, ru, ru'iya fi nafsi, which means it was inspired in myself that Fatiha is so valuable. It must be a ruqya. Mm-hmm. And it Inshallah. was from his own self that the saliva in his mouth when he recita- recited it was blessed. Mm-hmm. So that's item number two. Now, item number one. Ijtihad of Surah Al-Fatiha that it's a ruqya. Item number two, the fluid around it, right, is a ruqya, which is the slav in his mouth. And it's spittle a little bit. Yeah, not, a little not spit. Not like pouring spit out the guy's leg. No, it's a little spit. People need to hear this. Yeah. They need the, the details. Before yeah, a little, they a little bit of saliva, right? <laughs> number three, took a, took a wage for it. And then they said, Oh, Master of Allah, he took a wage. He said, you took a wage? He said, yes. They said, what was the wage? He said, they spend the night and they gave us a sheep. And I said, and he said, and what would you do with that sheep? He said, we cooked it. He's like, then give me some of the meat. <laughs> <laughs> and to show everyone that what he did was okay, uh, he, the Prophet himself ate from that meat. Okay, So that's the first piece of evidence. Now, one of the most beautiful um, sources of uh, healing is from hardship in general. And this ayah says, وَإِن يَمْسَسْكَ اللَّهُ بِضُرُ فَلَا كَاشِفَ لَهُ إِلَّا هُو This part of a verse right it states it's from surah yunus and it's the ayah number 107 
which says, If Allah touches you with harm, there is no one who can alleviate it except him. And the ayah goes on to continue. It says, And if he wills good, no one will return it except, uh, by, except him. No one can refuse it. Right now, why is that second part? Why is that important? Some people fear being too blessed, that I'm going to get hasided. Right. So the first half is a cure for someone who feels afflicted by trials and hardships. To remember, number one, this trial and hardship is not from a force outside of Allah. This is so important because where does the where how does shaitan destroy addicts? He destroys the addict by making the addict believe even your God can't fix this, right? That this drug is so powerful, your God can't. Addiction is so bad, your God can't even overpower. So in this ayah, it's reminding you, even your affliction is from Allah Taala. Now there's two parts of this. You shouldn't think about afflictions as being from Allah, if it's going to affect your iman, in a sense that. If, if let's say some man's daughter uh, I don't want to say something really bad but let's say you know let's say some some man's daughter fell and hit her head or a woman's daughter fell and hit her head it's like a really bad thing for a woman because you know they really want to make sure their daughters are pretty and stuff right now she's got a scar down her face now a husband's not supposed to say everyone Allah did this that's wrong right you're not supposed to do that because you create a suit of one bad opinion of Allah right now, however, if you're an addict and you feel that your sin and your hardship or you're oppressed and you feel that your oppressor is so great, you start feeling hopeless. It's years and years go by. Then you have to remember even this oppressor is from Allah so that you don't fall into hopelessness. Right. So this ayah, everyone should know it. There's no one going to alleviate it but him. Now, why is that part important? So that if anyone thinks that there is an outlet through disobedience, through some, through the haram, like they're like we can get this rid of this oppressor by siding with these people. Well, that's haram. If that if that's haram, it's not going to work. There's no one who will alleviate it but Allah. Means as well, you can only use the methodology applied by Allah. Right? You can't do access God's barakah without by disobeying Him. Okay, so that's a good one. Now the next one, if you're afraid, some people are afraid. Oh, too much good is happening. I don't deserve this. Right? Uh, and I might get hasad, blah, blah, blah. You recite the second part of it. Right? If Allah truly wills good, and you're worried about someone else, either hasad, or they're going to steal it from you, or they're going to something else, you should receive, read this, because it means that no one will take it away from you. No one can take it away from you, if Allah wills it for you. Yeah. Yeah, just a question, you know, that some of the listeners might have, you know, is there like a certain number of times you would mm -hmm. read these? Like, how, what, is there a certain time? How would you even read it? Is you would just keep reading it. Prescription for it. Good question. You would just keep reciting it until the matter is complete, right? Mm -hmm. And you would recite it in the prayer, in outside the prayer, as your as your surah in the prayer, right? You would recite it at all times, and it depends on like how how what kind of personality you have. And this is one of the things that I felt like. Uh, we got to become people of persistence and demanding. We got to de we got to be pushy, right? In, in what we want, because this is a, this is an attribute in in general society that's waning, right? People give up way too easily. People uh, have a type of entitlement that there should be an app for everything, right? <laughs> Wallahi <laughs> I'm not even joking with you guys. The other day, I was watering the plants at MBIC, right? We got like six plants. <laughs> right i'm not even joking with you a guy who was one of these it guys he said what are you doing I said i'm watering the plants he's like there's an app i was like stop right <laughs> <laughs> he literally wanted to tell me there's an app you buy it you download it for free you pay them a buck they send you these chips you put the chip in the soil and it sends a signal to the app when it's dry i was like it releases water or something i have no idea you it's a chip you put it in the soil right and this, when the chip gets dry, it releases a signal to the app, to your phone. I was like, what about, I have something else called eyes. <laughs> <laughs> right? And did wow, you forget wow. about this methodology? Oh. The same method I'm going to look at my app to tell me it's dry. I could look at the soil <laughs> and know that it's dry, right? <laughs> so, but, so uh, this addiction yeah. to apps is absurd. It's because of the space cadetting of American youth, man. Oh, my god. They're a bunch gosh. of space cadets, man. Yeah. They, they, they walk by the plant and they'll be like, it's turning yellow. <laughs> <laughs> and not even know what to do I about know. it. 
I'm telling you. Uh, oh, uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to that tangent after this is all done. So I'm gonna, I have a, I have a 15 minute tidbit afterwards. Well, let's hear it. No, no, no. You finish this. Okay. More important. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If something good comes your way and you miss it. Wow, finally the air conditioning's done. That was really... Thank you. <laughs> but I, I was really... I was warm, so I needed to turn the AC on. If something happens that was good and it miss, and you miss it, uh, like you miss out on it, right? Or something really bad really bad happens and you're sad about it. This ayah is for you and that ayah is from Surah Al-Hadid. All right, ayah 22. Ayah 23. la ta'saw ala ma fatakum. So that you shall never be sad about what you miss out on. So... No one should have fear of missing out. Mm-hmm. You know, some people, when good things happen, they get so silly, so giddy, right? When I was young, if it was game day, that's the best day of the week, right? I was so silly, right? And then my parents would have to calm me down a little bit. Or something bad would happen, right? Like a bad thing would happen with a friend or something. I'd be down for days. It's actually a reason why siblings are important. Only child. If you're an only child, it's... And I was an only child. My sister was 10 years older. But it's only effectively child. only yeah. child, yeah. Because she was off at college when I was in in 1988. Her, she graduated high school in 1980. I mean, you're 10; she's a 20 year old adult. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, but so when a good thing happens, there's there's no need to balance it ever. Whereas mm-hmm. when you have siblings, if there's a good thing happened, but your other sibling had a bad thing happen, you have to temper your happiness. You can't be so happy when he's sad, right? Yeah. Or vice versa. <laughs> Right, it makes sense. Unless and, you're a bad sibling, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and the opposite. Mm-hmm. If Absolutely. really bad things happen, uh, you have your siblings to get you out of it. Same right? with clo- same with close knit family. Right? Yeah, close knit family. There's too much. It's almost the idea of multiple nails stepping on many nails, right? Instead of stepping on one nail. So it's actually easier to raise a crowd of kids than one kid. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Because you can say you're all idiots, right? <laughs> and nobody gets affected by it, right? You all acted like fools. Wow. And nobody, whereas if you say you acted like a fool, that's, and there, and he has got to go to his room with that. Whereas you all acted like fools, right? They're like, at least we'll feel together about it, right? <laughs> and then they go upstairs and they talk about something else, right? So it's easier to, 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 to teach a crowd, not to, not to call them idiots, but sometimes fools, uh, fools, <laughs> fools, so, Safi, right? It's in the Quran, acting like a Safi, right? You're a Safi. لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا أَتَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلْ مُخْتَانَ فَخُورُ Okay, so that's one. You have something to say, Moeen? No, keep going. Okay. آيات الشفاء The آيات of general cure are usually compiled as six آيات. Okay. Uh, where are they? Uh, six ayat are considered ayat al shifa. Now I'm not going to recite all six, but maybe we should put them up. But you know, maybe I'll, I will recite them. Uh, yeah, yeah, let people pull over and take notes. Yeah, pull over, listen. Actually, you know what? I'm going to recite them in a row. Don't let anyone say anything. Then people could clip them out, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If somebody if somebody wants to go ahead and do that, yeah, yeah you can clip them out. Clip them out. I mean, I people clip them. our podcast out and make put YouTube clips up all the time. Yeah, they could do that in all the time. Audhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim wa yashfi sudur qawm mu'minin. وشفاء لما في الصدور يخرج من بطونها شراب مختلف ألوانه فيه شفاء للناس وننزل من القرآن ما هو شفاء ورحمة للمؤمنين وإذا مرضت فهو يشفين قل هو للذين آمنوا هدى وشفاء صدق الله العظيم So uh, let me give you now the ayah numbers The first one is Surah At-Tawbah ayah 14 Surah Yunus ayah 57 Surah An-Nahli ayah 69 Surah Al-Isra, Ayah 82. Surah Al-Shu'ara, Ayah 80. Surah Fusilat, Ayah 44. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six verses of Shifa. And as a general practice, uh, you see in many of the books, to recite this over water, blow in the water, and everyone in the family drinks from it. You would recite it all at once? Anyone would recite it. No, no, you would recite yeah, all six at once? Just as I did. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Wa'ish Fisudur Qawm Mu'mineen. And all the way down, you read all six all at once. And whether you blow on water and recite it or drink, recite it above the water, that does it either way. Or no water at all, just recite them, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, these are the ayat of shifa in the Quran. It's and this just is just for general sickness. General shifa, general, general cure. Shifa, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. general cure. Ayat al kursi, of course, for many, many things. And surah al kaf. Ayat al kursi, not necessarily specifically for a disease. Or a sickness or anything, but on Ubay bin Kab, Kala Kala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Ya Abal Mundir, 
أو أبو المذر أتدري أي آية من كتاب الله معك أعظم which آية to have with you is greatest so he means to have with you means to recite it all the time right قال he said I said الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم فضرب في صدري the prophet struck my chest and said والله ليهنئك العلم and I've never actually uh, known how to pronounce this ليهنئك like, anyway العلم يا أبا المنذر right so that that I've seen that ليهنئك العلم may, may happiness bring glad may knowledge bring glad tidings, uh, tidings to you O Abu al-Mundhir right and notice here the word daraba is used here no the prophet did not hit him in a painful way right daraba right? so when you when you tap your friend on the back right or you or you pat someone on the chest okay that is the word daraba was used <laughs> how about this ayah from Abi Umama and by the way if like, there's a power imbalance there so it's still oppressive yeah <laughs> <laughs> if any of the brothers who are uh, knowledgeable in hadith you know I've always tripped up on this word because here it doesn't have a hamza so anyway uh, you're always learning something and you always have to admit if you don't know something وعن أبي أمام قال قال رسول الله من قرأ آية الكرسي دبر كل صلاة مكتوبة لم يحل لم يحل بينه وبين دخول الجنة إلا أن يموت. This beautiful hadith from uh, Ibn Sunni. Okay, and the hadith before that was a very well-known hadith that was from Imam Muslim. Uh, it says if whoever recites Ayat al-Kursi after every salah, nothing is between him and paradise except death. Mm. I mean, how wonderful is that? When you after salah, every salah should have Ayat al-Kursi after it mm. in your tasbih after that. Surah al-Kahf, we all know. That it's khas. It has a specific value and benefit for akhir zaman Like we all know that. قال صلى الله عليه وسلم من قرأ سورة الكهف يوم اليوم الجمعة أضاء له النور ما بين الجمعتين. So firstly, to for gar, for for protection from the jad is to recite or to memorize to memorize the first and last ten. But from uh, whoever recites kaf on the day of Friday, Allah gives him a light between the two jumas. Okay, that's from Al Bayhaqi. All right, so Surah Al Kaf, we're not going to get say any more because we need. Uh, here's Man Hafada Ashra Ayat Min Awali Surah Al Kafi, Osima Min Al Dajjal. Okay, and Muslim. And in another, whoever memorizes Hifd, the first 10 of Kaf, he's protected from Dajjal. And there's another one that says last 10, so you should do both, first and last 10. You have something to say? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, speaking about end times. Uh, there's the famous hadith I can't uh, quote it literally mm-hmm. uh, Where I think it's um, uh, Ibn Hudayfa Who uh, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman Who asked the Prophet And Prophet is talking about How bad the fitness is going to be mm-hmm. uh, fi- uh, Like Qita'in min al-Layl Yeah Qita'in min al-Layl in muslim Like yeah. cuts of the nar- dark night Yeah. So fitness coming after and after And then uh, Hudayfa al-Yaman uh, Asks Like what's the way out Rasulullah True. And uh, uh, the Prophet Islam says uh, the Quran. Right? And I'm I'm telling you that uh, if and Nursi said ex- the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. He said uh, Nursi was speaking. Said Nursi, uh, uh, He was speaking in the 1920s, uh, right? And he said for the future, the only way out for the Muslims is through the Quran. Yeah. Right. And I wanted to mention. I um, interjected to mention a story. Nursi gives an example of what it means to have a chronic worldview. Mm-hmm. Like, or what does a person who has a chronic worldview look like, and what uh, what does a person who doesn't have one look like? Mm-hmm. So he gives this amazing example. He says, imagine you're there's a tunnel, and you see train tracks, mm-hmm. right? And you you knew nothing about trains. You let's say you know nothing about trains and how they operate, nothing. And you have a very tough guy, right? And he knows nothing about trains. He's been living in the, uh, you know, jungle. Uh, and he's a very strong person. And then he hears the train coming out of the train tracks, right? And he's standing right next to the tracks. What is he going to think? It's like there's a monster coming out of the tunnel. Yeah. And, and when it comes, when, when the train comes out of the tunnel, he's going to be like, he just runs away, even though he's like very tough, yeah. right? Now, compare that with a child. Let's say he grew up in the city. Mm-hmm. As the train's coming out of the tunnel, he's standing right next to the tracks. And the train just passes by, and he's yeah. not scared. Yeah. Right? And Nursi says the difference is that 
the strong person, he 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 thought that there was a monster coming out, like monster that's on the loose, yeah. that that's not guided by anything, right? But the child, he has complete conviction that the tracks and the the person driving the train is in full control of the train. Yeah. And he says that the example of the child is like the example of the person who has the Quran in their hearts, mm -hmm. right? That the entire world, everything around them, whether it's good, whether it's bad, he knows that somebody is driving the train. Yeah. Right. And this this gives and Nursi says this this gives un, unlimited confidence to the Muslim because whether they're alive or whether they're dead, it's all good for them. And right. one of the points that's funny that Alex and I on the way here, we were talking about one of these monsters that people view as a monster, which mm. we shouldn't as Muslims view it as a monster. We should view it with Husna Dhan, good opinion of Allah, is climate change. Now, mm. climate change is something viewed as a horrible thing that we've done. Now, Allah does not punish a people except for some act of disobedience. For people to invent cars and to invent all these things, nobody did it with a malintent, right? Nobody did this malintent. And climate change is the result, okay? And the melting of the solar ice caps is uh, the consequence, right? So we should not view this that, that, that this is a... We should view this that there may be a wisdom behind this. Now, one of the wisdoms is you have 8 billion people on the earth. You're going to need some more water, right? Those, those polar ice caps are actually like uh, the reservoirs, right? And we need to melt them down for people. So we shouldn't, yeah, okay, maybe some uh, s coastal cities are going to be in trouble, but they're not going to be in trouble overnight. It's not going to be like the movie, like in the movies that all of a sudden uh, it gets flooded. It's going to happen slowly, right? And the idea that there's a global warming discussion should indicate to people if you're living on the coasts and you're like a big company like Goldman Sachs, you might want to think, well, we got a lot of money in these buildings. We could move over. So there's plenty of time. It's not like a shock, right? But the idea of melting of these solar ice caps is Pol to provide... Polar. Uh, polar. What did I say? Solar? <laughs> polar, <laughs> polar ice caps, right? It's to provide more water for people because you're going to have more water, more into the rivers, into the lakes, it's uh, into the earth itself, mm. right? Coming up in wells. There is... Why don't we look at it from a point of view of Husna Dhan, Right? Like, so the, on the one side, climate change is the great monster coming to us. On the other side, it doesn't even exist. What about the middle? How about it does exist, but it might not necessarily be like a punish, a, like a, a monster. Mm. It's something that it has a wisdom from Allah. You, you want to hear my crazy theory? Okay, You're let's totally hear gonna laugh. Does, so, does it. Does it have Hosna yeah, with Allah? Yes, Hosna Okay. That, uh, climate change is usually my juj? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Let's not, um, let's not go into zombies. That. Yeah, okay. zombies. It could be. You never know. Um, so the... Uh, <laughs> so the... There's a flag on the play. Absurdity. <laughs> Repeat. <laughs> last comment. <laughs> so the... <laughs> most of the most of the places that are going to be affected by climate change are actually Muslim countries. The If you look at Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, you know, uh, Turkey, for example. Explain. So Where's the, the Arabs, though? Is Arabs, that the only ones that count? They <laughs> live in the desert, so it doesn't matter. The, um, the, <laughs> the Muslim countries are going to be affected by this because of the sea level rise. And what I'm thinking is that all these Muslims are going to lose their homes and they're going to go somewhere, right? <laughs> so you're going to have, uh, like, you're, you have the Syrian <coughs> crisis right now. Yeah. You, know, you have the Syrian crisis right now with uh, <laughs> Germany, right? Where all these Muslims are going to Germany, yeah. right? You're going to have an even bigger crisis when these uh, when this happens and you're gonna have Muslims flooding into all of these um, uh, traditionally really? non mm -hmm. uh, well I didn't mean that as a pun but flooding into all of these non-Muslim countries okay. so this is an opportunity for Islam to actually you know research okay yeah. maybe. Yeah. maybe you never because know you're gonna have like uh, you know America gonna be tons of Muslims Britain tons of Muslims but you but, you, but there will be the climate change will affect others too it, there, will, it might be a wash right it will but uh, I mean like uh, Florida you know, if U.S. Loses, loses Florida, right? They're not losing like a big thing, right? But Bangladesh is going to be like completely. <laughs> I'm <laughs> no, sure seriously. we have some listeners in Florida who would disagree. I mean, right? Florida's just made out of like retirees and like it doesn't have like. It doesn't <laughs> <laughs> Don't open a nursing home, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying it's a vacation spot, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a vacation spot. But Bangladesh, like half the country is going to be gone, right? Really? Yeah. I so, did not know this. So half the country is going to be gone. Where are all those people going to go? Uh, one of the um, uh, big scientists, I forgot his name. He's like a hundred years old right now. He suggested that you actually do like forced deportation of populations, right? Wow. That you take you take uh, a large number of populations from these countries and then you put them in like safer places. 
So I'm telling you, maybe he, yeah. He's living in La La Land. I mean, <laughs> his like theory. I mean, his theory is you know theoretical, but it's unethical too. You can't just force people. The, the thing is that these things, honestly, you just never know what's going to happen. You know, mm-hmm. there's no yeah. way to just, just to. Anyway, let's get back to this. That's that, but it was a good, uh, good comment there. Here's one that is uh, for. We good? Um, yeah, I was just. I'm trying. I'm tr- I was looking that word in the hadith. Uh, it has Tashkil on it. It's unpronounceable still. Liyahnika. <laughs> Liyahnika. <laughs> okay. Hanaka. Now I know. Thank you for... And and we have to also thank the source. Abu Am- Amina Elias. Mashallah. Dot Mashallah. com. Okay? Good. Salafi side probably. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, well, why do we have to go there? Muslim <laughs> and that's it. He's <laughs> a good brother. He's a good brother. No, on, actually what I was thinking... on Twitter. Yeah. I was thinking the other day, we need to also just revive the idea of being Muslim. Why do we have to look at the the, the issue? Right. Malik has a comment that's amazing. He said, if a matter is clear, if the, it, it, if the matter is true, then it's clear and it has re- requires very little discussion. And if a matter requires much speech, then there's some error in it. Mm. And I don't like, do not like to speak on many matters. Right? <laughs> he didn't like to speak on matters where the truth wasn't absolutely crystal clear. Mm. Surah Al-Ikhlas. <coughs> Man qara'a surahs qul huwa Allahu ahad and and if you notice that they actually call it they call most surahs by the first ayah if you did something very bad very sinful the recitation of surahs qul huwa Allahu ahad 200 times in one day right expiates 50 years of sins so let's say you woke up or you know previous day you had done some very bad sins okay recite surahs qul huwa Allahu ahad 200 times Okay, throughout the day, doesn't have to be one time, right? In one sitting, throughout the day, okay, <laughs> it will expiate fifty years of sin, Tidmidi. Okay, so that means Surah Al Khalas. I mean, it's big. Uh, of course, Surah Al Khalas. Any doubts? Anyone who has doubts about Allah, it's La ilaha illallah in Surah Al Khalas. All right, let's look at if you have an enemy. Many wives use this to have abusive husbands. Okay, maybe husbands who have abusive wives. Right? <laughs> Verily, there are people who were said to them, were, uh, Be careful as the people are gathering against you. They said, Allah is sufficient for us and He is the best of ones to rely upon. They left, they got out of the situation with a blessing of Allah and increase in their state. And no harm had touched them. Right? And Allah is the one who gives great bounty. So you come out not only unharmed, not only you're going to come out of it, number one, you won't, it won't kill you. Number one, you won't be harmed. You won't be, you won't be touched by harm. And number three, you're going to gain on top of that. All right? So that's if you are sort of being pushed around. Another one, Ilaj, uh, is if someone who is struck by sadness because of their own actions so it's one thing where the enemy is against us right then you're like a victim and Allah is with you anyway right but what if it's your own action okay so in this case the dhikr for it is from it's what it means is when Yunus السلام, was in the darkness of the darkness of the darkness, which is the darkness of the belly of the whale and the darkness of the sea and the darkness of the night. So is the belly of the whale, then the bottom of the sea, then the darkness of the night. And so uh, he was sad. He was extremely upset okay, by his situation. But he wasn't like oppressed. He took this action and this is the result of his own action which was that he left the city uh, from doing da'wah to it uh, without permission and a prophet's not allowed to do that right so he said la ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al-zalimin so this ayah has tawheed tasbih and istighfar mm-hmm. right there's no none worthy of worship but you glory be to you I was from the oppressor surah al-anbiya verse 87 this is the ayah for <coughs> sadness if someone's feeling sadness and some people feel sadness right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I really don't know what that feels like, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? But some the people feel sad. The president feels sad sometimes. Yeah. He says it on Twitter all the time. Sad. Yeah. <laughs> so sadness is one of those things that Ibn, uh, Ibn Qayyim, 
<laughs> this, is, this is so wrong. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Ibn al-Qayyim says sadness. There are two types of sadnesses. There's a sadness that is really zuhud, such as this, the, the solemn attitude that comes upon a person when he's at a graveyard. And he said this sadness is good, right? Because it draws you near to the akhirah and it makes you move to be better. Then there's the sadness of loss of dunya and loss of something, right? And he said that is purely from shaitan and you should fight it as much as you can. And that sadness, honestly, yeah, okay, may come upon someone as a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, you will all be sad if, you know, your, if your best friend stabs you in the back, you're going to be sad, right? <laughs> but even that sadness, a mu'min knows it's going to come, it's going to be for a little bit, and all of the dunya comes and goes. It's very hard to, to handle this, right? It's very hard to handle this. And the, the when you handle something really sad, everything else becomes easy. That's from the signs of, in the, verily, with hardship is ease. Right, and with hardship is more ease. So, if you face something really sad, everything else is much easier. Like parent, people whose parents divorced when they were in their middle of their life, right, in their middle of their youth, is extremely sad. But like nothing thereafter can be as sad, right? Mm. You have this situation, Subhanallah, right? Oh, like what can be what can be more sad than that, right? So I was alright. Yeah, and then <laughs> not, not, even at the time. Yeah, not only that, you sort of harden to it, right? right? It's like very few. It's like you see someone who's sad, and you're like you're sad. Right? For what? <laughs> what happens? You have cancer, right? <laughs> so uh, sadness is something mental. I'm telling you it's mental. If it, you can get yourself, psych yourself out of sadness. And I'm telling you, there are some people who give up. This generation, they just give up to sadness and they go down. They seek it. They seek it, right? They, and they, they try go, to find ways where it... To be sad. Oh, yeah. this, is, this is me. Yeah, and I'm, also... I'm being affected by it. And I think some people react differently from you and they fall into the sadness then they don't know any other state yeah. they're actually worried if they're not sad right so they find reasons to be sad and I think that this sadness it's really true what Ibn Qayyim said is it stops you from action mm-hmm. right and people can actually fall into that perpetual state and I'm not going to yeah. take this into a long mm-hmm. tangent but that's what happens to a lot of people they fall into that sadness and then they recite verses of Quran and still feel sad and it's like <coughs> well I deserve this sadness right mm-hmm. because of my my, my sins. sins or whatever I may have yeah. done and, and you know like I, I deserve to be sad and I should be sad sad like Islamo-emoism yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of people like, gothic Islamic wrong. Go- there's a lot of people like that well mm-hmm. sadness and anxiety could be a punishment from Allah it, for sins it could be right however that doesn't mean you just wallow in it yeah, that and doesn't make, mean you stay in a stay in a perpetual yeah. state of anxiety, right? It's so, period. You, well, you know, you, you have to use the words carefully, right? You got to think of what words you use because that's what affects your heart. Because, you know, you you have to get out of it. You have to make your snap out of it, right? You, you have start, to start with Alhamdulillah. Start with Alhamdulillah. And mean it. Don't yeah. just say it. Mean it. And and just like pushing a rock <laughs> or pushing a desk in its place or pushing a fridge, you're pushing the emotion out of you. You mm-hmm. literally. I don't know how to explain it. It sounds very much West Coast, like some kind of uh, <laughs> guru stuff. But it's really true. It's really true. You push the emotion away from you and you get afflicted by it, but unafflict yourself, right? Mm. All right. So when you are hands up and there's nothing else you can do about a situation, you turn to Surah Ghafir, Ayah 44. Now I have turned this affair to Allah. A very early Allah sees all, 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 uh, all the servants, all his slaves. Okay. If you are, um, let's see what's next. Now we go to actual other things like Al Ism Al Adam. You guys are getting tired, I know, but we'll finish up I'm soon. Here. Okay. Al Ism Al Adam. Al Ism Al Adam, okay, it is in the Ayat uh, Al Kursi and also it is in um, the opening of Ali Imran. Okay. وَإِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهٌ وَاحِدٌ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ الرحمن الرحيم And in Ayat Al-Kursi uh, <coughs> uh, Sorry, Ayat uh, Al-Imran uh, Alif Lam Mim Allahu La Ilaha Illa Huwa Al-Hayu Al-Qayyum No, they got this Yeah, Alif Lam Mim Allahu La Ilaha Illa Huwa Al-Hayu Al-Qayyum And Ayat Al-Kursi Allahu La Ilaha Illa Huwa Al-Hayu Al-Qayyum La Ta'akhudu Sikhs Wa Okay So uh, that's uh, Al-Ism Al-Azam and the, the, Allah's greatest name. Allah's greatest name, right? And it, and it has it. such a barakah. Now, why is it valuable when you make dua? Because the Prophet said, "I'm linked al ismul adam to dua." So these two ayahs, right, to recite it with your dua, because Allah says, if he's asked by this name, he doesn't reject the dua. Now, another one, uh, uh, we're talking about sadness and grief. Uh, the uh, the solution for that is 
ألا بذكر الله تطمئن القلوب. So the ulama said literally it says ذكر الله. Any ذكر of Allah will re- re- release anxiety, but the concentrated potion is actual the name of Allah. Mm, so just Allah, Allah, Allah. Allah. Yeah, and this is the dhikr that some people do not like. They say there's no evidence for it as a practice, but it's clearly right. Uh, it said in a hadith, right? The qiyam won't come as long as there are people saying Allah, Allah, mm. right? It says one thing. Okay, wathkur isma rabbika, right? Allah says in the Quran, make dhikr by the name of your Lord. Mm. Simple. That's how simple it is, right? So the name Allah itself is a shifa for for the matter of like anxiety. Is, is there a prescribed like count of how? No, how all of these dhikrs, Yeah, the count is until you feel better. You have to keep pushing, and people don't realize that you actually need to do a lot of dhikr in order to feel better. Mm. All right, next one is headaches. Mm. Headaches are big, right? Uh, now they go to every or pain in general. min rabbikum wa Right. This is an easing of the burden. And a mercy. This is from uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 178. They said is a shifa for that. Yurid Allah an yukhafif ankum, fukhirq al insan al daifa. But the first part of it, you recite. Yurid Allah an yukhafif ankum. Right. This is from Surah An Nisa, Ayah 28. Another one. Al ana khafaf Allah ankum. That's beautiful. Now Allah has alleviated for you. Right. Al ana khafaf Allah ankum. That's Surah Al Anfal. And, and what's the book that you're reciting from? So we can just, uh, the book? Is, yeah, is there a specific Why book? Why did you tell the people it's a book? I want them to think I'm smart. <laughs> 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 okay. It's a book that I picked up in Egypt written by a scholar that uh, he gathered these, right? Yeah, it just says, Fi hadil kitab in the back. Like, this yeah. book. <laughs> it's like just, is it like, is it? Like, it's uh, just, it's what, like, uh, wow, that's a blurb written in poetry. That, that doesn't make any sense. What? <laughs> Look at the back. Oh, it's a blurb written in poetry, yeah. But you know what you know what this type of book is written by a sheikh in like the fifties. Oh, okay, okay. And the publisher would be like, um, you know, the publishing house in Qahira in Hussein Street by the Green Door. Right? Mm. That's the type of publication it is. But those are so blessed, these old publications from Egypt, right? Mm. So you know, literally in my PhD thesis I have a footnote that I, I literally wrote what the publisher said, which is, you know, Cairo, nineteen sixty nine. All right, by the green door. <laughs> like the, right? That's that's the location of the publication. All right, for your eyes. فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حَدِيدٌ سورة uh, قاف آية twenty two. Okay, so this says فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ. So we lifted your the, your veil. Now your vision is now like iron. So for people who have issues with their eyes, their eyesight is weak. Now you know that many people would be like, they're almost like. Um, Atheists, when it comes to believing that ayats can cure physical illnesses, like they like totally disbelieve it. I've seen it. Yeah, I, it's it's because of, uh, and we'll do a whole whole topic on this, but it's because of naturalistic. Um, it's naturalism. So it's there naturalism, was right? there was a sheikh, an Indian sheikh, that he was giving ilaj by Quran, and a secular Indian came up to him, Muslim, and he said, he was a physician. He said, "This is why we're backwards, right?" And he said, you don't think that uh, the ayats can affect the body? He said, no, these are just words. You need some chemicals to change, <laughs> to cure. He said, okay, you know what? I think that you're actually very ugly. So your mom must have been very ugly. Your dad was ugly. And he's like, what? All right? And you're a sheikh saying this? This is how you respond? He said, well, hold on. Let me check your pulse now. Right? He's like, it looks like your heart's beating a lot faster. Your face is a lot redder because it said you're ugly and your mom's ugly. So that's just words. <laughs> but it affected your heart. It affected your blood pressure. It affected how you look, right or wrong, right? Okay, next, because we need to finish. Um, pain in general. Okay. Okay. And in this, ma sakana is what settled, what became peaceful. Surah Al-An'am. We need one for coughs. I was about to say for coughs. <laughs> okay, for the throat. Here we go. Next chapter. Subhanallah. All right, for the, for, for the throat. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, this is a hadith. Now, in Shu'ab al-Iman by Imam al-Bayhaqi. Okay. All right. Wathila ibn al-Asqa. Sahabi. Wathila ibn al-Asqa. Anna rajulan that a man shaka ila Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He complained to the Prophet, peace be upon him, the pain of his throat. فَقَالَ لَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَيْكَ بِقْرَاءَةِ الْقُرْآنِ 
So whenever you get that, recite any Quran when you get the throat. <laughs> you have the, I had the throat so bad my first two years working uh, in Dawah, giving the khutbah every week, giving multiple classes and lecturing and lecturing and stuff. I had I was I had throat infections that were so bad the first two years. Literally, it's death. And I'll tell you why it's death for the secondary, not just the pain. The pain was so bad, throat infection. You can't eat or drink. When you can't eat and drink, you have no energy. You sleep. When you sleep so much, it hurts your eyes, right? But you have no energy. You, you're oversleeping, right? It was like torture because you can't stay awake. You have no energy to stay awake. You have to eat or drink, right? And you can't eat or drink, but you keep falling asleep, but the sleep becomes a source of pain for your eyes, right? That sickness knocked me out two, two weeks, two years in a row. I was really bad. It was so bad. It was unbelievable. I remember that. Yeah. You remember when I had those? Mm -hmm. And the doctor said, wear a handkerchief around your neck. Is that, why you're, is that why you're so worried? I started I was like well, where am I going to get that so I took a uh, cloth that we had and ripped it and Wait, I just, is that where you started the yeah. handkerchief thing yeah I thought that was it, just well if you notice <laughs> if you notice uh, <laughs> I haven't worn it for like years I was going to ask you I haven't you gotten my sicknesses I was going to ask you I just buttoned up my shirt well I just buttoned it up that's it. Yeah, he got sick so many times, his vocal cords became like iron. Yeah, I'm like uh, the Ibn Battuta <laughs> yeah. when he got sick on his first trip. All right, we we only have a couple more. Left. <laughs> Next one, the chest. The chest. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Witnessing a miracle right Yeah, <laughs> so, well, all of a sudden, no more cough. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. This is for giving a speech. This is for anxiety of the chest, like when your chest is tightened because you're oh. upset about something. Mm -hmm. It's for giving a speech, right? It's for hardship of affairs. And if it's when you can't express yourself, okay? And it's when you need to communicate. You recite this dua, this ayah from Surah Taha. It's 25 through 28. It's three ayahs. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul min lisani yafqahu qawli. This is Prophet Musa, what he said before Sayyidina uh, going to the uh, Fir'aun. Right? Of course, we know the first thing he said, say to Fir'aun a gentle word. Some people stop at that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> 30 years later, he's still saying a gentle word and the guy's killing and, and uh, pressing. I realize that the matter escalated a little bit. But of course, that's a prophet. Of course, that's a prophet, right? So he was doing that by Allah's command, not anyone else's command. Now, for the chest sicknesses of the chest right uh, uh, and this is the general recitation of Quran in general for the chest because he says in it it is a cure for what is in the chests that's not just spiritual it's physical too right okay and that is from Surah Yunus Ayah 57 for those who are trying to write these down all right the next one for heart and stress we said that already from Surah al -Rat, by the remembrance of Allah. And recite the name of your Lord. All right, for birth, any women who are about to have a baby, all right, if you're in labor, you recite the first three ayahs of Surah al inshiqaq If the sky opens up. And it took permission from its Lord and it emptied. وَإِذَا الْأَرْضُ مُدَّتْ And if the earth expanded, all right? وَأَلْقَتْ مَا فِيهَا وَتَخَلَّتْ Okay? And emptied what is in it, all right? And released what is in it, and it became empty. And then you just repeat that last ayah. Every time you open this ayah, you, you keep repeating وَأَلْقَتْ مَا فِيهَا وَتَخَلَّتْ وَأَلْقَتْ مَا فِيهَا وَتَخَلَّتْ And it means, and it released what's in it and became empty. So in this case, you're talking about the womb, right? How about the womb? Okay? So that's a beautiful one. And I uh, said it to my friend one time. He said, my uh, wife is about to have a baby, right? And uh, um, and is there a dhikr for this or is there an ayah? I said, yes. Surat al-Inshaqaq, right? إِذَا السَّمَاءُ أُنْشَقَّتْ وَأَذْنَتْ لَرَبِّهَا وَحُقَّتْ وَإِذَا الْأَرْضُ مُدَّتْ وَأَلْقَتْ مَا فِيهَا وَتَخَلَّتْ He said, is there a hadith about that? I said, it's in the Qur'an, right? It's the Qur'an, right? Because you recite what makes sense. And this makes sense. وَأَلْقَتْ مَا فِيهَا وَتَخَلَّتْ And it releases what's inside of it. Right, and it became empty. So you're talking about your womb, okay? A hadith to tell you to recite the Quran. That yeah, Subhanallah, it. yeah. So just like we said in the opening, what is the usul of this subject matter? It's all ijtihad based on the meanings. Mm -hmm. And we just said Abu Sa'id al-Khudri made ijtihad that Fatiha, which has no verses of healing at all, is a uh, ruqya, 
Okay, so uh, the ulama all have agreed that um, that this matter is basically. Uh, uh, I've used that in hadith. Yeah, numerous times. Yeah, which one? The Abu yeah. Sa'id Khudri hadith. Yeah, yeah, it's, really it's very important. Fatiha. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, by the way, anything Fatiha, mm -hmm. anything yeah. Fatiha. You, if you live in Tarim, if you go visit Tarim and Dar Mustafa, you recite like a thousand Fatiha. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I was with a taxi driver who said, "We're passing the grave of so and so Fatiha." Talk a little bit, right? Grave of so and so Fatiha. Right? <laughs> grave of so and so Fatiha. We were reciting Fatiha all day, right? It's but beautiful. It's beautiful because those people in the graves getting benefit, That's right? Well. They benefit from that recitation, and you're benefiting because, and you're benefiting because it's of talking about. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. Who won a minute or nine? <laughs> <laughs> Is that even a show? No, the fun, his, his, <laughs> it's, it's his comment was so funny. He's a, he's a he was a common man from Tadim, probably from Ahlul Bayt, because so many people from Ahlul Bayt. Yeah. But his commentary was so funny. He, this he was a, he was like you know, uh, the Wahhabiyah say it's all bidah. I was like, okay, no fatah here, no fatah in the next road, no fatah in the next road. Where's the Islam? Right? <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you have, if a child, if or an adult or anyone fears, um, it, it gets shocked, right, or is having fears or nightmares, okay. فضربنا على آذانهم في الكهف سنين عددا ثم بعثناهم لنعمل لما أي الحزبين أحصى لما لبثوا أمدا. So uh, why does he recite this ayah from Surah Al-Kaf, ayahs 11 and 12? Because they were afraid, and they went into the cave, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Closed their senses from what they feared. He closed in upon them from what they feared. For the Rabbana ala adanihim, fil kafi sinina adada, thumma baathnahum, linana mayur his baini asalim alabidu amida, which means that then when you come out of that, you will see who's victorious, which of course means that the people of Allah will be victorious. All right, so there are many others, but of course we're going in on two hours now. Uh, of course, the chapter on the jinn is like volumes, right? Of course. But, uh, <laughs> it suffices for hasad is to be falaq al nas, all right? Falaq al nas. And some, sometimes, you know, you, you can you, you don't always agree with the ijtihad of a scholar because he seems like he's stretching, right? Like making a stretch yeah. on something. But, you know, it's all Quran. So what are you going to lose? You have nothing to lose anyway. Man qashra, man qara, here's a hadith. Or akhraja darimi an al mughira regarding forgetfulness man qara'a 10 ayatin min al-baqara 'indahum 'inda manamihi lam yansa al-qur'an okay so uh, uh, what are they arba' min awwalihi wa ayat al-kursi wa ayatayn ba'daha ayatayn ba'daha wa thalathah min akhiriha so this hadith from darimi the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever wants to memorize the quran if you're a hafiz and you need to keep up memorizing then every night before you sleep you recite the four first ayahs of baqara ayat al-kursi and the next two after it and the last three ayahs mm. for the Hufad or anyone who's memorizing Quran. Now someone's going to say he's going to recite all that. He's like, recite the whole Quran, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's half of the Quran, right? Now some people say, oh, these dhikrs, who has time for all this stuff? I mean, listen, when you get sick, you, at least you have you have a reference. You think Imam al Nawi was reciting the book of Athqar every single night? He's he, It's a reference book. It's an encyclopedia. Yeah. I, and I think one thing that's important to note is once you do get into the rhythm of reciting Quran, it gets easier, oh, yeah, right? Awesome. I mean, it's uh, obviously it's very daunting to someone who doesn't recite Quran that often. You know, how am I going to be able to do this? How can I go to reciting? You know, a, a his a his bidet is is mind blowing to a lot of yeah. people who are, who don't run on in the practice of reciting Quran. Uh, one thing that I'd like to bring up as a concept. Um, is uh, so my brother actually told me about it. Uh, he's into boxing, right? So in, in boxing, you know, they, they teach something called flow training. Uh, it's it's taught by a lot of other you know martial arts practitioners as well. I know Firas Zahabi teaches it. Um, it's it's this concept of you know doing a, a very minimal amount uh, of training every day versus you know trying to go all out and, and burning yourself out. So he gives the example of of Eastern. Uh, martial arts versus uh, the the Western martial arts, right? The the way of working out in in the West is you know you go to the gym you know three days a week you you know you you do like upper body and then you know lower body and then you but you go hard those three days and then you rest for the other four. Uh, whereas in you know the Eastern worlds, for example, how the how the Russians kind of work out is 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 they just do like a playful type of workout for seven days a week, right? And and you know if if you were doing for example. Uh, you max out at 10 on the pull-up bar. You know, the, the you know, Firas Zahabi's his advice is, you know, that he would tell his uh, trainees to do like six. You know, 
the 10 was your max, then maybe do like five. And then you come back and you do five the next day and you do five the next day. And, and that, that, that builds you up that over time, you know, you end up doing a lot more. And I found that this idea of flow training, you know, there, there's, you know, business folks who talk about this as well. This, this type of flow training is, is, it can be applied to everything, mm-hmm. right? And, and I found it especially helps when you apply it to the Quran or when you apply it to uh, dhikr. When you try to go and, you know, you listen to this podcast and you're like, hey, I'm going to start doing like one juz a day and you've never done, you know, any Quran, you're going to do one juz and you're going to be burnt out the next day, right? Mm-hmm. I, yeah, you got to go slow. You know, uh, go slow, right? I re- honestly, the, at a minimum, one line of Quran a day. You know, if you can't do that, then you should look back and say, it's like, why couldn't I recite one line of Quran a day, right? But outside it, of your salah, by the way. Outside of your salah, right? Like outside of your salah, like salah. one line of Quran. It's do, a ju- do it with the mushaf in your heart. In your yeah. yeah, if you can do that. Not just sit there and recite it from memory. Yeah, do it with yeah. A or, or, or a phone, hand. right? Yeah, a, a mushaf in your hand. Open it, read one yeah. line. Phone. Because <laughs> I, said I said forget the phone. Oh, I just yeah. said or a phone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, because I, I know that I, I've tried this method with myself, right? One push-up a day. And it's like, it sounds so stupid. It's like, you know, how can you not do one push-up a day? But yeah. once you're doing one push-up, you're like, oh, well, I mean, it's kind of, kind of stupid to do one, so I'm going to do your, a few you, more. Your right? groove gets right. thicker over right. time. So you're like, okay. don't work out, don't do one push-up a day. Right. Yeah. But then, any, I mean, almost anybody is like, okay, I can do one push I mean, if you can't do the, the regular one, do it against the wall, right? But it's like, once you do one, you're like, all right, it's kind of stupid to do one, right? So I'll do five. <laughs> I get that. I, I, it, that's, that's really good for the beginning. Yeah, right. absolutely. And, and your groove will naturally get deeper over time. Your groove, this Imam al Ghazali told about this too. Your groove will, you, you're creating a groove. Every day practicing, you're creating a groove. And your groove gets thicker and deeper every day. But I wanted to ask a question since you mentioned the Russian. So you said the American way, way is to go hard, and like the Russian way week. is. They would, uh, so for example, instead of doing, let's say, I'll use the example. Is it the Russians or the like the Dagestanis and. The Chechnyans and the Circassians. I know, I know Firaz Zahabi specifically talked about the Russians and in, in, in the piece. But, that, but like, for example, let me give an example. Uh, let's say you do five pull ups a day, right? For 10 days, right? Versus somebody else who comes and he does 10 on day one, rests, then does, you know, 10 on day three, and then rests, then 10 on day four, and then on day six and then rest you know by day seven you know the other person has also you know done what five times seven they've done 35 the other person has done 30 right because they've done 10 10 10 right so it, your quantity over time actually ends up being greater than the other person that's actually uh, true right i just uh, my only point was the americans versus russians because didn't we beat the russians i mean he just gives an example in terms yeah. of the like, muslims beat the russians just fyi yeah, uh, of the afghans <laughs> uh, well he, no but he, i'm just wondering because he meant that's, he know. meant to, i mean he, he gave the example of you know you have like this one american who comes up out of like you know ten thousand, whereas like every other russian can yeah, be like that's true <laughs> like okay. every other russian is like a you know okay a, a, i actually a world class i fighter. totally agree with this method and this is the method of if anyone has, you know, the 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 Turuk and the Mashayikh who give dhikr, this is what they do: small words, but don't miss a day, mm. right? Small words in the morning or in the night or both, but don't miss it ever. And it's only literally three minutes, five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes, yeah. minutes. It never passes fifteen minutes. A word, no. if you know how to say it, never passes. No. But don't yeah. miss it. Yeah. All right. Very good. So uh, I think we can wrap up now. If yeah. anybody wants to close, they're welcome to close. But I'd like to give my rant about. Oh, that. let's hear it. What so, is your rant? So I was gonna. I, was, I don't want to cut you off before, but I, I need to say something about this Earth Rule show. Okay, let's hear it. <laughs> Still with this? <laughs> let's hear it. I, I don't want to interrupt. The, I don't want to. So, so one. Okay, look, it's a great show. Alhamdulillah, it teaches honor and chivalry and all that good stuff. But could could it not be done in like fifteen hours versus the three hundred and fifty hours? <laughs> it's a, but it's a soap opera. It's a soap opera. Yeah. Soap operas come on five days a week. Yeah. Oh no, I, I, I get know it. this from 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 Spanish culture. Novelas, they're an hour each episode, and they come on five days every a week. every day. I mean, the whole show yeah. of Arturo, you don't even need to know what's going on. Just listen to the music, and you'll know what's going on. The bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be like, oh, it's it's you know it's yeah. the, you know it's the 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 Crusaders, the love you know, scene the, the, it's the love scene because it's like oh you know and then you have like the tum, 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 and he's on his horse now it's like he's probably on his horse now so I can funny. tell you what's going on in the show with the with the video off. <laughs> I have a worse theory than this. The worst theory than this about Arturo. I think that 
gonna say you're it. You're gonna get refuted no, on Twitter. Say it. I'm not gonna get refuted. I think that a lot of dudes look at it like um, not in an aspirational way, but in an admirational way. Mm. They're looking at these actors. They're just Turkish actors. They're yeah. not like actual superheroes, right? They're these Turkish actors, and they're looking at them like, man. The Muslims used to be real men, and I'm just sitting here playing video games. <laughs> like, just go out and become a real man. Yeah. <laughs> Stop watching it on TV. Wait, did you uh, get your well, gun license yet? No. You live in the South now. I'm getting my gun license. Uh, south Jersey is the South? Yeah, my, my wife texts me. What's South? Yeah. <laughs> my, my wife sent me a text. I said it to you guys. She said, um... How was the drive down to the Mason Dixon line? <laughs> <laughs> and are there a lot of people trying to make America great again down there? <laughs> Surprisingly, oh, there's wow. not that many Republicans down here. Yeah, no, I was just kidding, man. Sort of. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah. but yeah, no, but you should because believe it or not, this is different. Like the police chief in your town will be very easy about it. They're pro-gun mm. down here mm. as opposed to North Jersey. Interesting, yeah. but uh, yeah, that was my my. Little okay, that, that's not to say that the show probably isn't. I mean, it's f for like younger kids and stuff. I think it's a great. Yeah, show. it's probably right? a fun yeah. show to watch too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I don't sure know. I've seen. I mean, I've seen the first season. It's just yeah. long. I, I I wasted an incredible amount of time watching them on the horses, and I was like, that's when I got fed up, and I was like, okay, I can't. I, I mean, can't do another. It's like seventy hours a season, right? It's ridiculous how yeah. long it is. Well, and I was like fast forwarding through like the pieces and I was like, okay, <laughs> like, I, you know, I, I can't continue doing this. It's just way too long. Mm. I'm not going to make fun of it because I had my experience with Yusuf Emery. Mm. Yusuf I Emery. started that show as I, well. And I watched like, 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 like 12 episodes or something. And I was like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> like, when is this actually going to start? <laughs> so it's a drama. So I, yeah. I get it. I get it. I'm sure it's it's, it's great. Yeah. There's a lot of goodness to it as well. It's but, Eunice Emery, sorry. Not yeah, but Eunice. it could be cut down from the 350. Yeah. Uh, so if you're going to spend that time, you know, read some Quran, it probably yeah. might be more beneficial. Well, here's the thing. I mean, people, uh, if someone's, I never understood someone who says, I'm going to watch this. I'm going to get through it. It's entertainment. You watch when you feel like it, right? No, no, no. no. That, <laughs> that's that's my thing. Like. Okay, if you're going to sit down and you're going to watch it with your family and it's like a thing and it's like, that's a good thing. Yeah. But the people who sit and binge it for like <laughs> six weeks, like what is up with that? You know, I used to do that and then I felt so bad like a loser that I stopped doing it's it. It's one thing so. if somebody tells me, okay, hey, you know, me and my kids, we watch it every night. It's like a thing. It's a family thing. That's cool. I mean, yeah. I that's the halal means of, you know, lahu. Yeah. But the, the guy who's binging it for six weeks, <laughs> like... But Oh, wait. Do the math. It, you have to go 14 and a half days with no sleep and you can finish it. <laughs> I never did entertainment when I was single. There's no need, right? I only do it for the sake of any type of family. By the way, right? when I was single, yeah. Yeah, my, wife could, my, wife, well, my wife can testify to this. When, when, when we got married and she came to my, to, she moved in where I was already living on my own, yeah. there was a TV with no cable. It was like a little box TV yeah. sitting on a milk crate with no cable. Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, what kind of life is this? <laughs> yeah, no. I and when we moved to England, so, yeah. there was an apartment, a one bedroom apartment and a kitchenette. No yeah. TV, no nothing, no TV. Uh, right? I, uh, and uh it was only 8 months in that uh, Sheikh Babikr Sudani, rahimahullah, I mean hafizahullah because he's in England right li alive right now. He sort of convinced me to maybe go a little bit easy. <laughs> so I went to uh one of their stores, okay? And I picked out a TV that has a CD player. I bought it home. Literally, my wife was like crying. <laughs> 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 that there's going to be something. And I went and I bought one DVD that we watch. If you want to watch, you watch it again. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but uh, that we, I was very austere as a youth because yeah. there's no need. Yeah, this, this is my youth. That life when you're young. Yeah, this is my youth. This is the foundation. <laughs> but once you're getting into community and family, you have to have something to do, right? I got... I got the TV, right? So yeah. I was like, all right, fine. I'll put cable, right? So I put it in the cable and I was like, what the hell is going on here? Because, yeah. well, like, I was, I mean, this is not a brag. Like, I just, I just didn't have it. So I, uh, my nafs isn't better than anybody's. Yeah. But I didn't have it available. So yeah. I, it just stayed away from me naturally. I was like, I, so I hadn't watched TV in a few years, not listened to any music or anything. And I was like, what is going on yeah. on TV right <laughs> now? <laughs> I was talking to uh, Naeem and, and yeah. uh, Jibril. And I was like, yo, did you see what this, what the heck is on MTV right now? <laughs> All you have to do, go to YouTube and go to the trending, trending page. No, I'm good. And subhanAllah, like, it's just like, uh, Final, out it's been a it. running joke yeah. because I was like, did you guys see what the hell is going on? TV? And they were like, you don't listen to, what are you watching MTV with the sound off? And I was like, I was flipping through the channels, bro. It's crazy. Final, <laughs> final comment. 
for parents. Would you allow me to come and spend the night with your kid alone in your room? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? You wouldn't. You, it's a joke, right? Of course. It's absurd. Yeah. What well, would you let a stranger do that? Well, what, what in the world doing? is a TV, computer, cell phone alone with and your kid who's like 12 years old, 11 years old, right? Just think about it. Your local imam says, let me come sleep over with your kid tonight. You'd, like, well, you'd be gone crazy. But you don't think that the, through the internet and the computers... Okay, so nothing physical, no touching, right? But that's the only thing, that the computer, the internet, the cell phone is no touching, right? Yeah. But other than that, would you allow a clown to come? I won't touch your kid, but let me entertain him, right? Absolute stranger. No touching, but let me entertain Just him. behind all, the glass wall. Yeah, behind the glass wall, me and him all alone at night. And I might strip. Yeah. Because that's what Any, the kids well, are anything goes. That's what they're seeing. <laughs> yeah. Anything goes. Yeah. Anything the goes. The only thing is... Glass wall between me and him. Close the door and don't look. Would you allow it? Anything goes. Sounds like the plot of a horror movie. Yeah, <laughs> it is a Bro, horror movie. It is. Man. It's it's modernity, man. By the way, I, it's a it's a different subject, but it's the same subject. Yeah. Just like you wouldn't let the sheikh go. Can I stay over with your kid? Yeah. Don't send your kid to stay over with the sheikh. Of course. Mm. Dude, no there's, no. there's no need for you to be shipping your kid off to learn knowledge nowadays. Yeah. Do not, do not be in the same room, even if it's like the, even like the back room of our masjid. We have cameras everywhere. It's a policy. You cannot be in the same place with a minor. I'm right? encouraging people not to send their kids off to boarding, uh, like yeah. Yeah. Islamic schools. Yeah. Don't do it. Boarding. Yeah. yeah. Don't send it because there's always some, some pervert that gravitates to the, towards that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't so, think because everybody there prays and has a beard that there's not some sicko. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, there almost always is. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk wa al-asrin an insana lafi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu amanu al-salihat wa tawasabu al-haq wa tawasabu al-sabr. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I was saying kulhu Allah wa ahlullah samad the whole time. Yeah. Cough and chest. Subhanallah, I noticed.